All right, everybody, we are live. Welcome to the Break the Rules stream. I'm your host, Lev Polyakov. With me at this is the Sultan of Swing, Chris Chan Respector, Giovanni Penichetti, all the oh, way live. Oh, don't say... Th oh, God, you ruined it. You ruined... <laughs> yeah. And we got Turkey Tom Whoa. in the house. We got Default Friend. We got Big Bad Billy Pratt. And we have Adam Lair who's got a new book out that I would love to find out more about. But uh, we are starting this stream out talking about uh, Chris Chan for what is it now, Gio? The third time? Fourth time? Fourth, I if you count. Fifth, if you count the shorts and my video. Oh, so, man. Yeah. What are what, what, we're milking what have we this become? Cow, we're milking the Jule. What have we become? Worth. What have we become? We do streams <laughs> with, like, uh, you know, professionals and think tanks, and we do this. And uh, that's the way it is. Anyway, everybody subscribe. Keep subscribing. You know the drill. If you guys are new to BTR, check out all of our previous videos. A lot of wonderful uh, things in there. But we're here to talk about Chris Chan, and uh, Billy Pratt had a lot of great questions. The first one of which is, how did we find out about Chris Chan independently? So before we get to the nitty gritty... Well, we gotta go start shilling. Yeah. Well, G Gio. <laughs> shilling time. It's a shilling... Sorry, that, well, that was a head well, PE song, Killing Time. Well, Gio, let's start, let's start with you. How did you get introduced to Chris Chan? Oh, I thought we were gonna promo Adam's book. Okay, let's just... <laughs> we'll do that later. Um, I think it was way back, it, it had to have been Encyclopedia Dramatica around, like, I want to say 2009, 2010. That's wow. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Like, he, I, it was literally, like, I was finding an article about, I want to say, it was, it's probably about TJ Kirk, you know, and then it made a reference to Chris Chan, and I'm like, who is Chris Chan? And from that, it started with all of, like, imbibing in the sagas and the mythologies, and yeah, that's how that's how many years I've known about CWC. Now, now I'm curious before. if you're going to be the most old, old school of, of us all. The old f -slurs? Ah, I don't know, maybe. Probably. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> well, Billy Pratt, uh, I don't know how old you are. I mean, you are uh, a very wise person, I'd say. You had a lot of uh, <laughs> amazing experience that you wrote about in your book, which I am also going to be uh, shilling right now. Uh, so uh, it's called Welcome to Hell. So buy that book. And after it, as more people get in here, Adam, I would love to hear about your book as well. But anyway, Billy, how did you get introduced to Chris Chan? Well, um, I had heard whispers of Chris Chan over the years. And I just thought it was, um, you know, something kind of like silly millennials thought was funny. All right. This guy who has, you know, clearly has special needs writing like a kind of, um, Sonic the Hedgehog fan fiction. It didn't really resonate with me until, <laughs> until it was revealed that he was, um, having sex with his mother. And when you hear something like that, <laughs> So that you know, resonated just, with you? <laughs> 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 All right, maybe resonate's not the right word here. Oh, man. But I mean, that was something where it's like, I gotta see what is what what this what is going on here that Chris mm. Chan is trending on Twitter for sex with his mother. So in feature the length feature length <laughs> Chris Chan film directed by uh a tag team of Larry <laughs> Clark and Harmony Kareen. Mm. That's, <laughs> that's that'll that'll happen. Well, opinion. I wonder if it'll be similar to the uh, Mario Brothers movie where they're going to get like a Chris Pratt type actor to play Chris Chan, or like you know get like oh, a man. handsome like A lister to uh, play him, and maybe get a Sharon Stone since she's like uh, coming up in age to play his mother. You know, oh, so she's still God. kind of uh... a. <laughs> Sharon Stone. That's the first name on the list. Not like. <laughs> But I think that, as it turns out, in my, in my research in Chris Chan over the past few months, I, I have to say, in my opinion, sex with his mother is probably the least interesting thing about Chris yeah. Chan, which is incredible. That's, that's an incredible statement to make. So I hope we get to flesh that mm. out over the course of this podcast. And what I love is that you're coming from this perspective as a total normie in a way, where this is like fresh and new for you. While I think yeah. for a lot of us, this has already become, you know, something like, how would you describe a Geo? It's become very uh, mundane well, almost in a way, like we're used to the madness. Extru like if you're terminally online for any amount of time, then Chris Chan just becomes part of the pantheon of like internet mythology. But it's... Like, I mean, we've gone through this before on the show, but I'm 
the, the prison letter sort of reveals a lot of interesting mm. things. Well, we're going to do but, a read-through you know, of the prison letter where each of us takes turn uh, reading it. So I'm going to link it in the chat for all of you guys to be able to read it with us. But uh, anyway, let's go to <laughs> Default Friend. How did you discover Chris Chan? Uh, I think it was Encyclopedia Dramatica too. I don't know how I discovered Encyclopedia Dramatica. Now that's a that's the question that I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to remember the answer to. I but I do remember being 13 years old, um, having a Facebook, being groomed by some Harvard student, and starting a Facebook group right right when it, they're really early, or maybe it was a page called "I Did It for the Lulz," and then being so obsessed with Sonichu. <laughs> This is amazing. I didn't. This is another layer. I can't believe this. But. Now, why why Sonic Shoe specifically was something that you got a test with? I mean, this probably goes to Billy Pratt's earlier question in the uh, chat of, uh, just like in that uh, documentary by Gino Samuel always states, what is the attraction? So I guess it's kind of premature, but why not? Like, what was the attraction to Sonic Shoe for you personally? I think I was just so blown away by all of these kind of characters that were popping up at that time because I like couldn't believe how abject and kind of like, it, like just like they further like freak shows. I remember I was like obsessed with Jamno and I would always send him DMs on MySpace because I was just like, how is this dude real? Um, if you got, if anyone remembers remembers him from the the WoW forums, and he, he was also looking for a a, a boyfriend free girl. Um, but yeah, I just, I just like couldn't, I mean, I grew up in a very manicured environment. So like this was just, uh, and I somehow like, I feel like I, I didn't know any men like until I was like 16 or something. So it was just, it blew, it blew me away that this existed. And were it's you funny. a fan of either Sonic or Pokemon growing up? I loved Pokemon. Um, I was less familiar with Sonic, but I had some like weird, um, some weird, it wasn't like a Game Boy, but it was, it was like a, proto game boy from like the early 90s and it was like long and there's a sonic game uh that came on it but that was my only my only interaction with it wait was there a sonic uh, for the game boy i mean there was for game boy advance but uh, anyway, it wasn't it wasn't yeah. a game boy it was some other like game gear proto game gear probably you're is that what of. it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That was, that was an interesting system. So uh, now let's go to uh, Turkey Tom, and we're saving Adam for last because I would love to uh, get Adam to show his book uh, when uh, he speaks about uh, Chris Chan. But Turkey Tom, how did you find out about Chris Chan? Um, I mean, I'm a lot younger than you guys, so it definitely was not from ED. It was 2015 or 16. It was, like, right before all the YouTubers got in and made videos about it, like, before the Down the Rabbit Hole, before that shit. Um, it might have been from going on Kiwi Farms, but I don't remember exactly. It feels like for the most of my life that I can remember clearly, like Christian has just kind of been in the periphery, like a fact of the universe, you know, he's there. Oh man, yeah. that's wow. terrifying. It's like, it's like the kids who grew up with, uh, see, uh, because Brittany Venti's manager told me not to even say that because of algorithmic reasons, which may be going over the top, but you know what I mean? That thing that happened in 2001, you know, that, uh, uh, people uh, still remember like Turkey Tom, you grew up after that. Uh, wait, when were you born? What year? 2002. Well, yeah, Holy there, there we go. So that's what I'm talking about. So I think I it's kind of like 2002. That was a banger year. Like the age of, uh, like the age of uh, all of this uh, TSA stuff and all of these draconian things kind of coming to be. You didn't experience the uh, 90s, where it's almost like now I take it for granted that I got to grow up at a time before a lot of this stuff formulated. So I do wonder, like kids who grow up and you know not to say that you're a kid turkey tom but like you know young people who grow up i mean i am a kid I'm yeah you're a kid though, fine yes <laughs> it's funny you bring up christian because it's like we're getting to the point now where christian has just become like part of the like kind of accepted like zeitgeist and so you know yeah. they, you, you know the kind of like cringe lord you know that uh wears like what what's that anime thing like the ahigao face you, you know that the ahigao, ahigao face hoodie yeah uh there's this dork uh, in one of my classes, who wears that shit around campus unashamedly? Wow, and like the multiple, the day, like the collage of the multiple uh, faces. Yeah, yeah. And the other day in class, wow. he was like, "You guys heard about Chris Chan?" And I was like, "I want to kill myself. <laughs> I'm gonna slit my wrist and die. Get away from me." Yeah. I love like the the cringiest like reject in school is now like oh my god he about Christian. It's just it's like, like he's a guy who like he thinks he's like super like online and super internet and that's his personality like nothing beyond <laughs> that. 
And I just I don't know. Like <laughs> How could people like that like never know what's going so. on, right? Like they're never really that online. Yeah. You notice that? Hmm. Well, they're playing. Yeah, they're know. playing I a role. I I think they uh they're almost robotic in a way where they think, what identity can I assume so that people don't realize I'm an alien and they think that I'm an actual think, human being? It's just like you're just born like this really empty, soulless guy who doesn't really care about anything, and so the thing you have to care about is just like some like autistic shit that like you yeah, know you think is like the coolest people. shit ever all of a sudden. But yeah, I don't know. Like I didn't say anything about it. I wasn't gonna be like, well, actually. As a as a as a connoisseur of B, I know all about. So I'm not gonna like rip that out in class. You know what I mean? Like, mm. there's like there's a classic like filthy Frank reaction video I remember where he reacts to this video of this kid being like, "I'm a B-tard." Uh, yeah, that one. I know. Yeah. I'm a B-tard. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's trying to get like this little kid to say the N-word. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I maybe I don't have a lot of room to oh. talk. I, you know, my personality is like the music I listen to, but I don't know. It just pisses me off. Mm. Like I hate, I hate those kids. I want to kill them. I wanna wait, wait, them. Geo. <laughs> uh, I mean, Turkey, in Turkey Tom in Minecraft. in Minecraft, Turkey Tom. Since this is in YouTube, Minecraft. we gotta, we gotta be aware of the algorithms. It's and the all same that. kind of shit that, like, you know, you know, these like born in the wrong generation people were like, oh yeah, <laughs> like okay. So to give you some context, like for my age group, like the people that think that are people who listen to like '90s rock and think it's like the hardest, you know, idea shit ever. So mm. I'm sitting in class, you know, just kind of. Uh, it was like before class waiting for shit to happen. And I hear this girl behind me. She's like, oh, you know, I really don't like modern popular music. I actually think it kind of sucks. And and this kid next to him, or sorry, not, the, the kid next to her is like, oh, well, you know, what are you into? What uh, what old music really gets you going that's like really edgy and cool? And, and I'm expecting like, you know, something gay. But she just she's like, oh, I really like Nirvana. And I'm like, wow, you couldn't pick like a more... <laughs> Like you just picked pop music there. Like I don't understand what like yeah. what the condescension is with it. You could have picked a, you could have picked Soundgarden. That would have been a better. Or a little more. I, mean, it's like, I don't. I don't dislike Nirvana or Soundgarden. Yeah, it's just like, yeah she should have gone with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She should have gone with Gigi Allen. That would have been nice. <laughs> it's like the, yeah. it's like they pretend to be punk and they're like what's your favorite oh yeah like yeah. Uh, i don't the know thing with like the thing with Gigi, yeah well the thing with Gigi is like his uh, his stage performance is mad edgy but his music is like super terribly produced like mm. pretty pretty obnoxious punk rock music it wasn't that bad i don't know like uh no it's not like bad but sluts it's not in the like, city sluts in the city was not, nice carmelita i mean yeah but it's not well, like yeah, yeah, the, the, the real underground shit at the time mm. yeah exactly. it was closer it was closer to biohazard than it was propaganda at the time put it that yeah way. i mean like considering <laughs> considering like at that time there was already like white house and power electronics stuff yeah. happening he doesn't sound too intense in retrospect and uh before before i get to you adam as far as the uh as far as the shilling of your uh book that i look forward to reading very much <laughs> i want to ask turkey tom have you heard of gg allen yeah, I, there's some video on YouTube I watched about him. I kind of vaguely remember. Um, someone had done like a, it was called like the most dangerous rock star, or the most dangerous rock act, or something like that. So I, I get all that shit in my recommended. Um, yeah, I've seen. I think I watched that the same day that I watched a video about the guy from uh, Fuck Lost Profits. You know that band? Oh God, yeah. Please, yeah. I don't want to talk about that shit. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to, but it was like the same channel doing that kind of, you know, that yeah. kind of like music history mm. stuff. See fucked up people. When me and yeah. Default were kids, we remember the classic rock thing. That was a mm. total cancer. That like I remember one time I went into a Wendy's with my old man, and there was this kid that wore a Led Zeppelin uh, hoodie, and my old man like for some reason he was compelled to like go up to him. He's like, you know, I remember that exact same album cover. I remember that exact design that came out when I was your age. And it's like, <laughs> and the kid just stared off at him like, what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was the School of Rock thing that was probably. Mm. Well, let's let's go to Adam Lehrer. So, Adam, you've got a new book out, and you now know about Chris Chan. I think you may have known about Chris Chan before, or no. Tell us. Well, first, tell us uh, your thoughts on Chris Chan, and then tell us about your new book, and maybe the two can relate somehow. Let's see. <laughs> Let's try and work it out. Um, no, I, I found out about Chris Chan when Chris Chan was arrested for the rape, and I feel very kind of... I mean, I... I feel when things like this happen, I realize that I'm maybe less online than I think I am sometimes. Cause I'm like, 
I was like, who the fuck is Chris Chan? And then everyone that I'm friends with was like, how do you fucking not know Chris Chan? <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I still don't know really what Chris Chan's deal was or what like the posting style was, but nevertheless, I do have a lot of thoughts on the crime and the accusations being committed. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, I feel like the story confirms some of the ideas that have like proliferated throughout the last few years that have been like hard to talk about for various cultural reasons. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that may well, go, go into, go into it, Adam. Yeah. Then. Well, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Do you want to go into that or then your book? Well, yeah. All right. So like the hardest thing to talk about with anything related to like, transgender issues is you can point to data that shows like you know people that experience gender dysphoria have like a much much higher rates of uh, bipolar disorder schizophrenia and various other forms of mental illness now it's really hard to prove in that sort of um, dialectic of it it's hard to like you know, it's hard to know whether it's the dysphoria that creates these other uh, mental illnesses, which would make sense, or, and this is what no one ever wants to talk about, if it's actually mental illness that creates certain kinds of dysphoria. And um, I think both, you know, I think, you know, you can make a case for either one, but you're only allowed to make one case. Now, from the Chris Chan case, it's very fucking clear that this motherfucker lost his mind a long time ago. So, you know, did the dysphoria cause him to lose his mind or uh, did the losing the mind cause the mm. dysphoria? Or did the, the trolls I... cause him to lose the mind? If we were to imagine Chris Chan without all of the trolls, what would that life look like? Yeah, but I mean, like, he was, from what I know, he was just as online as the people that were trolling him, right? Like, that's the life you get when you make your, an ass out of yourself on the internet. We forget how much people look at this stuff, you know? It's... you. I have this book coming out and I got like an avalanche of attention, like all of a sudden, and I just smoked a joint and then just had like two hours of paranoia because you realize that there's like so many people looking in your direction. The internet sort of heightens that shit. Oh yeah. Well, but, um, well as far sorry. as your book goes, um, the uh, name of the book I have right over here is a uh, uh, communions by a yeah. Hyperdarian Press, that is the publisher. C can you talk a little bit yeah. about communions? And what is this uh, beautiful cover picture here? There's this guy with somebody inside of his head and some yeah. dog creature. What's going on? Uh, that is actually a painting that I own, um, which is by a painter named Alex Hardashnikov. He lives in Toronto, and he's uh, one of my closest friends. The painting I felt was evocative of addiction somehow. You know what? Uh, I'm just going to turn these headphones off. They're making everything sound funny. All right. Well, I think that you sound great to us. I'm not seeing any hearing any interference. Everybody watching this, subscribe, subscribe, keep subscribing. Patreon.com slash break the rules. Now there's a little bit of a static going on on your end, Adam. I do not know what's going on. There is some static. Before everything was good. Okay, I do not hear any static anymore. No, that's good. It's good. Yes. So uh, go for Wait, it, Adam. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, the painting was evocative of addiction somehow, and I just thought it would be really cool to have a sort of an abstract, a more surreal uh, painting that only embodies the meaning of the text on like a subtextual level. Also thought it would be cool to have one of my friend's best works on the cover of my book just for that, you know, synchronicity. And in short, uh, uh, in short, what would you say it's about? The painting. Well, the book. Okay. Or the, and the painting too. First book, then painting. Well, the book is a... So for a long time, I wanted to make a book that dealt with opiate addiction because for one thing, I've always loved the addiction tale as a subgenre, whether it's, you know, Burroughs or 
train spotting, Hubert Selby Jr., et cetera. But I did not want to do a memoir because I don't think the world needs another story from a writer about getting hooked on junk and then kicking, et cetera. Nor did I want to do a book that's just like a, a novel about people who use junk. So what I did was I had been, I had been writing these like weird stories just as kind of like creative experiments when I was still working a full-time job and before my career started to take off and such, um, where I would like place historical figures, mainly artists and writers and things um, in like the contemporary world and sort of have like this temporal collapse in the text. But um, I have a ton of these things. I never published any of them, but it got me thinking about how to write in this way using real figures, uh, biographical figures to make uh, metatextual, like speculative fictions. Um, and then those two ideas came together and I thought, what if I created like a series of short stories using uh, every chapter using a different artist, writer, or musician who was indeed addicted to opiates of one form or another. And it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a series of ghost stories in a weird way, um, because I'm basically like communing with, you know, dead people. But the idea is every single chapter I take on and inhabit the voice and like writing of another person. Um, there's a lot of different people in there. There's one chapter with Burroughs, of course. You got Dash Snow, Arto, uh, DJ Screw, you know. So yeah, I'm psyched. The early response has been positive. I'm jittery as fuck, but I am, nice. because it was weird. Like I just, you know, it, it got like already sold a lot more than I thought it would. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you sound pretty mellow. I gotta say, so yeah, that's just my style. It's my vibe. Mm. And the, up here now. Yeah, and the, <laughs> yeah, when it comes it. when it comes to the Chris Chan connection here, the one that I could at least see is people being addicted to opiates, just like Chris Chan is being addicted to displaying, uh, you know, oneself on the internet for all the people to interact with. And I think it goes hand in hand with, and I'm curious what everybody thinks of this. I think it yeah. goes hand in hand with the idea of the dimensional merge. Where, well, I got, yeah. I got, a, I got a better connection. Actually. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Well, one of the recurring themes in my book is that, you know, a lot of people were using opiates, Modigliani, for instance, for more practical purposes, lingering physical pain or melancholia, whatever. But also a few of the artists such as Dash Snow and others, um, they're themselves, the character they create, their persona becomes the thing that requires an uh, extreme amount of maintenance to maintain the image of almost like the self becomes the artwork and how that interacts with the press and a lot of like schizoid junkies I feel like develop these sorts of uh, walled up psychologies around themselves and then they mm. have to live and die by the image mm. this exterior image oh, yeah. created for themselves that seems clearly yeah. to have happened to an extent well, I wanted to do a video on um where I was comparing the le the gel letter, I actually recorded it, but then I had to like, I don't know if I have to can it now after this. No, thing. no, you, <laughs> could just, you could bury the lead if you wanted, Gio. You could say, uh, you know, you don't comparing, have to. Comparing, um, yeah, yeah. You well, don't, it was, yeah. It was basically comparing Chris Chan to Francis E. Deck and um, who else? Another like schizo poster. I want to say it was chris chan and oh bob hickman yeah bob bob hickman how they have a sort of an inner world that is like largely what uh Artie lang talked about is like the citadel of the self being walled in and it's like the true authentic self yeah is um yeah sorry my cats what do you want I just you. yeah she does like female cats they'll do that like they, they want to 
They want your attention, then they'll go away. Then they want your attention again. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's I'm well, not even joking. That's uh, that's what it's like to be in some but, relationships. But, oh God, but not that I would know. But uh, oh, but Adam, but for now, you, for now, Gio, <laughs> for now. Um, oh oh, she's climbing out my wires here. Wait, a book we, you have to get, Adam. Please, I highly recommend by uh, Don Leshbaum, Warhol Chris Chan, Warhol Chris hey. Chan. The most comprehensive oh, oh. art theory deconstruction of Chris Chan there is. And it's funny, Default Friend, you mentioned Abjection. There actually is a chapter here where he goes into Chris Deva's book, uh, Black Sun and Chris Chan. <laughs> so, oh, man. it's amazing. Please, everyone go and get this. I want to get him on BTR, even though he doesn't want to do any interviews after you know what obviously happened yes well by the way that uh geo what you said right now reminds me to also plug the uh sonic the hedgehog video i did which you can see in the background behind me sonic the hedgehog's esoteric secrets revealed so i did this video for max derrett it's a great video uh i highly recommend watching it it also goes into all of these depths about what is actually going on behind the scenes spiritually speaking with sonic the hedgehog and that's another idea that people have when it comes to chris chan as well not only with a dimensional merge, but just the idea of, like, what if Chris Chan is demon-possessed or something like that? So, I don't know, like, uh, uh, default friend, would you say that there is some legitimacy to that idea? I don't know if you are spiritual in uh, that kind of way. Like, do you believe that a lot of these things are just psychological problems, or there are other forces working at hand? Um, I mean, like, I don't, I don't think it's, it's demonic. He doesn't, he doesn't strike me as demonic. I mean, it's, it's just, like, uh, I don't think people realize how strong it is when other people are reacting to you through some kind of mediation, whether they're like an audience and you're performing or it's through the internet. I could see mm. that. Yeah. I mean, uh, now, yeah. Well, what about the Chris Chan is not possessed. Let's, let's just say Chris Chan is the hero of the story, or at least let's say classic Chris Chan is mm. the hero of the story. Now, what about the world being corrupted? And he, I mean, if you look at all of his interactions with all of the trolls he's interacted with, he was really honest and true as he claimed to be. Not really, and though. He did lie quite a bit. He I, lied to I, the I women, mean, especially. I oh, sorry, that... I'm, I'm destroying your narrative right now, but I'm very sorry. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> well, maybe it's like some of those Buddhist uh, practitioners, you know, like crazy wisdom. Like they had to lie in order to <laughs> yeah. teach them a lesson at like the end of the day. Next year. yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I definitely don't think Christian has any, any wisdom whatsoever, but I think that he did, all he could be was authentic for most of the time. And I think there were childish uh, exaggerations that he would... Um, uh, you know, and, and attempts to woo these women over, but yeah, well, I, mm. I I do think that sincerity is really all he ever knew, and I think that really, um, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the trolls were one hundred percent lies. Like, I mean, if anyone's oh. lying in this situation, it's it's he's being lied to constantly. But I think that he, I mean, he, I mean, look, when he was asked if he shit his pants. He said he shit his pants. I mean, yeah, who's, who's, he, he had a nervous tick where he would do that hmm. in public. He would. I shit believe his someone pants, else but... shit their pants recently, but I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> who who did who? Was it the gun uh, girl? What's her name? E uh, Ethan Ralph. Oh me. yeah, he on stream. That's right. <laughs> wow. There you go, buddy. There you go. <laughs> but in all fairness, it was twenty four hours. But uh, I can't believe he stole that debate from us between. Keith Woods and Joel and no, I'm don't kidding. worry about Gio. We've got to, we've got great ones with Sticks Hex and Hammer six six six. There's one oh, coming he, up. Oh, Sticks debated Richard Spencer recently on oh, Kill Street. Nice. <laughs> well, he's going to be debating. Uh, he's I forgot be about de Richard Spencer. Sticks yeah. is going to be debating uh, Joel Davis uh, next Thursday. So there we go. Oh my God. It's going to be uh, quite a time. But anyway, but apparently yeah. he, yeah, he he did the he his his drunken, uh, ha disheveled Maker's Mark squirt uh you know uh <laughs> fart squirts just let loose on stream and now he's in a big war with nick ricada over it for wow. some god i wonder if he, if he takes them and bottles them can he pull a bell delphine and like sell them or uh, <laughs> <laughs> level i don't know but anyway well maybe maybe yeah. his anime uh wife can 
Never, never mind. Yes, never anyway, mind. let us go finally to Chris Chan's letter from jail. So I sent it in the chat inside of Zoom for everybody. Does everybody have them? Is there anybody who does not have this uh, letter in front of them right now? Uh, I was going to do a dramatic reading, but I guess there's no point now. My no, you're going to be one of the people who's going to... Well, the difference is that now all of us are going to take turns. And you could start, Geo. So uh, September 19th, 2021. Go for it. Oh, wait, let me cue it up. Let... All right. There's a picture of uh, Chris Chan and uh, Jesus Christ next to each other. Which... Yeah, that's a classic one. That that is... Well, there, there was one where someone edited Chris Chan next to Christ, but... Uh, so September 19, 2021, um, I have finally received fresh paper and envelopes. Oh, so he's <laughs> like through the, through the, through the grates, like through the, yeah. So I feel it is advice to inform you of the following, all of which as you may will or will, you have my consent to relay to all the contents of this letter to Joshua Null Moon, as well as forward <laughs> the physical documents to David Elberg, my attorney. The following, uh, the following everyone should hear and appreciate sincerely. Wait, wait, wait. By the way, sorry. I, I, I don't oh, mean to cut sorry. you off. Uh, his lawyer's name is David Heilberg. <laughs> that's a bit of a... What? That's a bit of a... I thought it was Helberg. <laughs> oh, even better. Even more delicious. David Heilberg. The following everyone should hear, appreciate sincerely, authentically, and spiritually, and aura deep, as I swear direct truth to my left hand, Oh, wait, left hand? Left hand over my heart as I write this sentence. I thought it was the right hand. Firstly, I love how he says this, by the way. Firstly and vitally, <laughs> it should be made obvious and clear that aside from... An oh my God, he only knows this because of the book. Be <laughs> aside, <love> from <laughs> aside from Andy Warhol, my life events at present so far can directly be compared and matched with that which has been chronicled of none other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth himself in any holy Bible. Also feel free to take any unadulterated original photograph of my body's, uh, my body's face, neck and shoulder, chest area <laughs> where I am not wearing the glasses. Then I'll alter the photo to show a naturally growing brown beard mustache sideburns now place the photo next to any image of jesus christ on the cross compared look deeply into my eyes and photograph see for yourself i mediate i meditate and connect directly and genuinely with the cosmos both of our universal halves and throughout the timelines an entire multiverse. So despite some lack of physical evidence, I know what ultimate truths, facts, and details not commonly known or written down or chronicled. That, be that being stated, all of my life, my mind, my eyes literally held the constant perception of being the central camera dash zero 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 out of all the other cameras infinite from the first person perspective of others. So, oh wow! I channeled my uh, my Ooh. revelation Bible reading there. That was that was yeah. quite, that was quite something. Next, let's go to uh, Turkey Tom. Why don't you take it from here? All right. I don't know if I have quite that narration in me, but I'll do my <laughs> best. Mm. Oh. And this goes even deeper. And I encourage you to meditate deeply and see for yourself this and all of the truths. And the reason and truth behind my unique perception is direct and mind-blowingly simple. I am literally the real player one, the one avatar. <laughs> and this body, eyes, mind, and all, is the one God body. And I am literally also Jesus Christ himself, fully reincarnated <laughs> and fully reawakened. Even the dimension merge, literally completed and concluding. The same for the collective shift. All of this is literally huge chunks of the past, present, and in-progress events of my second coming, period. Not all details of the past chronicled scriptures, writings are accurate. And as a member of the Council of Gods and Goddesses with the strongest and direct of connections, I know details have changed some to a lot. In regard to the scriptures of the past, three days on Earth equal four months with 24-hour days and nights in the heaven realm so yes this is the one immortal body and that was none other than i off and on that cross over two thousand years ago 
in my past life, personally. Picture of a crucifix with a heart over the intersection, a horseshoe under it facing up, and two lightning bolts beside each arm pointing towards the bottom of the cross. I'm reading this from Kiwi Farms. I don't know if you guys have the pictures. Oh, I have like, lightning the uh, cross of it. Uh, right now. I yes. love how he got that like right from Revelation about the four ones. That was the time that the angel spent that was delivering punishment mm. to the during the time of the there's, first antichrist there's like real time cube vibes to this mm. too actually oh, yeah. this uh this picture over here of the cross it's actually very perennial because this horseshoe yes. as you say it's kind of like the crescent that we would see for example in the uh, hinduism and other symbols and i see it when i meditate as well like i used to like this crescent form being formed and these lightning bolts are kind of like wings being spread out too so it's interesting and like the heart it is kind of like the heart of the cross like right in the center so uh again like I don't think who's these, gonna go next I don't think these things up. are intentional uh, default friend why don't you go next <laughs> oh, <shit>. <laughs> <laughs> all right with moving on with all of that stated uh, moving on with all of that stated your last letter next why I had transferred that money on Saturday July 31st Josh had absolutely no right in relaying that detail publicly Friday the 30th Forced out of my home and temple, had nowhere else to go, had less than $50 between pocket money and only a couple of bucks or so in my bank account. No money from PayPal, Patreon, was not due for a payout until Sunday, and SSI was not coming into my bank until Tuesday. Harriet and Tom Ashby cast me out before I even arrived to M Midlothian. The van was not majorly uncomfortable josh had wired a thousand to my bank that friday but it would not arrive until after or on monday little food and options and you try bumming in any parking lot without feeling insecure and paranoid i needed safety and comfort as quickly as possible that is why i transferred that money i was going to pay it back in full even had 150 from patreon on sunday the first that went straight into barbie chan's account I would have paid the remaining 600 Monday or Tuesday, but Null had to fail his destined test and betrayed me. Like I was betrayed and jailed with a kiss over 2000 years ago. Now, <laughs> and as of the past arrest, I have absolutely no way to fulfill that repentance or anything else digital. Malachi 3, 6, 15, I repeat all that personally, now, all of you had to over-drama and fail your worldwide test of faith upon me. Oh, God. Right. Billy. Noel really is a Judas. Noel is a Judas. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man. PPP1. PPP1. All right. Let's see, let, let's see if we can uh, split this last one between uh, Billy and Adam. So, uh, Billy, why don't you go until uh, it is good? So, go for it. Sigh. And finally, the all-important popular present, F-A-Q. Why and what the hell, Emmanuel? God above all other gods and goddesses and one of my mentors herself had deemed me to heal, cleanse, and clear Barbara of all her past sins oh, and regrets God. and improve her abilities directly and personally as her goddess. We mainly cuddled, soul bonded, and talked. Consentful and emotionally and mentally supportive and healing. I did as I had done for and with a chosen few back in Israel over 2,000 years in cleansing them. Oh, More God. details for the Bible that had been overlooked and left out. Like fucking his mother. We gods <laughs> had eased up on the views of adultery. Why else do you have pro-gay and pro-lesbian, pro-trans and all today and past decades. Everyone involved were all being used, being genuinely, deeply, happy, content, and spiritually satisfied with themselves and each other. As long as all, all as long as all are over the age of consent and actively was consensual by all parties and genuinely spiritually happy. It is good. It is good. Wait, isn't that what God said when he created everything? And it is good. So anyway, finally, uh, Adam Lehrer, you've got the uh, last part over here. I have written further insights and details and already shared them with David Heilberg. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I imagine like Ryan Gosling in The Believer. Like, <laughs> or something. Yeah. 
<laughs> Assyrians make them come with their cocks. <laughs> <laughs> and I get out on second coming or sooner by uninterrupted co-divine intervention. All your demons and curses are no more and unrevivable. Judgment day, praise us, gods. Chris Chan, the, the, the god Sa blue. The, the so Chris god. Chan, Sanachu, the goddess blue heart and your <laughs> lord. Fuck Blue me. like Shiva. That's, exactly. that's, well, speaking of go. Shiva, was it not the case, Geo, that uh, in certain uh, interpretations of uh, the Advaita Vedanta or Hinduism, it was Shiva that copulated with his own mother? So there was incest. I think there go was. Yes. So kind of. Chris Chan may not be so far off from actually emulating the gods in this sense. Well, Chris Chan really is a destroyer, is he not? So, <laughs> Indeed. Um. Well, I mean, that is a good question, though. Like, is Chris Chan the destroyer, or is Janky the destroyer? And the, is Janky the embodiment but of I, Kali? I, I love, though, I wanted to, well, let, let's ask Turkey Tom this, but before we go, yeah. I love how he, in the very last, it's the most revealing, apart from beefing with Null over details, um, he'll cleanse clear Barbara of all her past sins and regrets that it was omitted from the Bible that Jesus did the same. So not only is Chris saying that um, through the act of via there, see with schizos, a lot of um, this is who I compared it to in my video without giving it away. Um, a certain someone with a certain room from a few years ago on Twitter. Um, they always have this connection between the, the purity of the, innocence and purity being corrupted and violated through the prof profanation of, a, of the procreative act. So to him, he's saying that what I did was trying to cleanse Barbara. And he's saying that Christ had, uh, I'm assuming, uh, violative sex with people um, in order to cleanse them. Like, I guess maybe mm. the lepers. So to him, Christian is healing the lepers and uh through that act of profanation and violation which i noticed a common theme with a lot of criminally schizophrenic people uh like lucas uh they always have this connection between procreation violation that's, purity corruption well, that's so good. fast all right i just gotta drop this like personal right. story because yeah. i have personal experience with this um girlfriend of mine long time ago, earlier 20s. We had like a very shitty relationship, I would say, but it took a turn for the worse, um, like about a year in. And uh, she started saying weird shit. Um, that was hard to notice at first, but like random comments specifically about her dad and her brother who had recently died, which was kind of the precipitating event. She keeps hinting about this some sort of malevolence in her father. And her dad was like a simple Salvadoran Christian sweet man. Like there was nothing about him that I ever believed was like evil. Hmm. But as she got into her madness, she came to, okay. So eventually she told me that her brother was her dad. And I thought she meant like, at first, like metaphorically, like he was like a dad to me because they were, he was much older. But in her schizoid madness, she had actually created this narrative in which her father had forced her brother to rape the mother, like very specific, intense, dark shit. It, to this day, I've never been so chilled in my entire life. Um, this Man. precipitated like a larger break from reality and she ended up hospitalized and I kind of divorced myself from the situation. Like there was just no fucking way I was gonna take that burden on. Um, but you know, it, it also reminded me of Chris Chan uh, in the extent that, um, okay, so I learned uh, during that whole ordeal that that kind of schizophrenia usually it's um it's equally biological as it is like as it is it's you know it's more nature than it is nurture like you turn 25 and you just kind of break from reality that kind of intense schizophrenia uh is usually shaped by the culture um 
which oh, is yeah. why like during the seventies and MK ultra, these kinds of schizoids would always complain about the CIA tapping their phone lines. Um, my ex-girlfriend there, her thing was that she was on a reality show. Um, that she was being filmed everywhere she goes, and, and you could not fucking tell her otherwise. It was nuts. So, so gangs talking, that was also an aspect of that. Yeah, and exact. And Chris Chan is very obviously like schizophrenic, but but, but he's actually being gang talk. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People no, I know. It. But the way his schizo, his psychosis is manifesting is definitely shaped by the. By like memes and and the online yeah. life, real or even not. the media he watches, like I can tell the different references there. Yeah, like you could pick like he goes from this weird like early like early childhood um, schooling in like Protestant mm -hmm. biblical literalism yeah. in the South to like this weird like andrine idea that is mm. much older well so, his, his father as well i think had a lot of influence on the kind of views that he had on gay people yeah. for example but by the way geo since you mentioned lucas there is one thing i quickly well, wanted well, to lucas, uh, bring if up you read the letters the reason i mentioned this is like you can easily pick out this same like narrative where like for those who don't know he was soliciting an underage girl um people say that she like entrapped him or whatever that's bullshit in my opinion um where he this connection if you read those letters between i want to violate you by impregnating you i'm violating you my chunky mustard whatever he like this relation between procreation and innocence being corrupted i remember i read that essay by lucas about beauty or whatever it was this very convoluted schizo theory cell not even theory cell it wasn't informed by very much of anything that he wrote, I think you could still find an archive of it, but it's like this similar line and, and Chris Chan over the years has also experienced relation to bodily fluids and voyeurism and uh, various functions like that he, sorry, that Chris Chan perceives as uh, being almost as this like sympathetic magic. But uh, sorry, Lev, I interrupted. Well, that. the reason why I wanted to bring up Lucas is I wanted to, uh, Focus right over here just for a second. Let me see if this is going to... Oh, no, no, this is a big screenshot. Hold on, let me make it smaller. I want to show you one quick thing that I have here in the Sonic video. So just watch this part just for a second. So this is where I'm talking about how uh, people are stuck in terms of playing video games into this mode of uh, almost becoming like these animals trapped inside of a cage where they're forced to press this combination of buttons. So this is what I have. Watch the background right over here this is what i have for the character who's playing the sonic game here it comes you notice the background changes to a certain color oh god and here we go you oh see the room god. he's in the room he's in the room exactly so just wanted to share that quickly with you that's the sonic video i did check it out later guys but yes lucas's room is still resonating with me when it comes to a lot of uh, a lot of this <laughs> stuff it never goes away Oh. So, Turkey Tom, what do you make of this uh, fantastical uh, letter that uh, Chris wrote? I mean, it's just a bunch of like retarded bullshit. I don't know. Like, it's just gay. Yeah. <laughs> I really mean, no, I guess, I guess, like you know, you're probably right. Like, this is all like everything that Chris seems to write is like a product of like this like media that he takes in. So, all these biblical references are definitely there for a reason. Um, yeah, I don't really know. To be honest, I'm not super familiar with scripture so i don't know if it's mm. my you know best place to comment on it but i mean it was interesting to, to read check it out later well, well geo when it comes to uh the uh scripture Wait, Matt Forney or... has a good comment oh, here there we go that woman is just as disgusting as chris chan nobody will willingly gets involved with chris chan has good intentions the attempt to force meme her as hero is pathetic yeah i noticed a certain someone on uh well a certain group of people um on the on the kill stream we're trying to do this thing where um she's innocent and chris chan is mm. now i think they're both how could anybody how could anybody who destroys and tortures animals be innocent <laughs> at all like that's that's well, it. because they were in a beef with null at the time so that's probably why huh. but um no, no, no like here's the thing i think that they're both evil uh, but there's a lot of, as we said before in BTR, there's a lot of suspicious things going on with Janky. But go, sorry, love, go, go ahead. Well, I was wondering when it comes to Christianity, what did uh, Christian get right? Fuck. <laughs> I mean, you're the expert here. 
Nothing. I mean, <laughs> well, he has this. Um... I love that he thinks Israel is 2000 years old. <laughs> that, that Jesus, grew, Jesus grew up in Israel. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's amazing, like on so many levels. That he is like the American dream Absolutely. wrapped up and festered into like a pit of um like a bot like a, a pit of bile. Like that's literally what a lot of like probably like Israel first um Protestant evangelicals believe is that like Hmm. You know, well, to be, to be fair, the uh, the territory that uh, belonged uh, to like, who did the territory belong to at that time? It belonged to ancient Rome. But at the same time, was it still considered to be a part of Israel proper? Because that was like the kingdom of uh, was that the kingdom of Judah where uh, he was located or because uh, I think it may have been around Lebanon. Right. Isn't that where he was? Uh, I I'm not sure. Well, he was born in mm -hmm. Bethlehem and Bethlehem is where at that time. Oh, where is Bethlehem? Isn't Bethlehem in Israel? Oh, yeah, I think. Is it? Well, Billy, do you? Oh, I have no idea, man. Yeah, so Be I think Bethlehem was a part of Israel at that time. So that's correct, isn't it? Well, I again, we're not going to. It's okay. I, mean, I just think in Chris Chan's interpretation of it, Israel is a country just like any other country. And it's these countries are eternal and have been around for thousands of years. Mm. I think that's like as far as his, but I think that his believing that he's Jesus stems from religion becoming another consumer product in his life. And he's mm -hmm. in jail. He doesn't have his toys, which you know is a big deal for him. And he probably has a Bible. So he's probably looking at the Bible and thinking that at the same time, he's being persecuted. He, he could identify with Jesus because in his view, he's being persecuted for I mean, who even knows his understanding of the charges, but he believes his relationship with his mother is consensual. I mean, that that's his yeah. understanding of it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the, I mean, keeping most basic, simple terms for Chris Chan, he's being persecuted. He has a Bible right there. Suddenly, I am Jesus. Mm. Well, it's yeah. not just I am Jesus. What I'm really fascinated by here is Chris Chan has this sense of uh, what do you call it when you are not sure if anything else exists except for you? What is the name solipsism. of that? Solipsism. Yes, yeah, solipsism. There is an extreme yes. solipsism going on here where it is a weird thing, right? Because none of us actually know if anybody or anything that's going on around us is, is real. The only thing we know is that we are conscious of whatever it is that's going on. So I think in Chris's perception, it's like he is the only thing that has ever existed, truly. But what if, I mean, if you're Chris Chan, you have a low IQ, you have a limited understanding of the world. You really just understand the world from media. And suddenly you're this person for no, no reason he could possibly understand people are fascinated and document his everyday life almost down to the hour. How would you yeah. interpret that if you're Chris Chan? That's, uh, that's pretty true. I mean, that is something that would happen to people. Uh, default friend, what do you make of this? Uh, do you see any grain of truth or any grain of substance within this letter? Or are you with Turkey Tom on this? I mean, I'm with Tricky Tom. Well, I'm more with Billy, <laughs> I'm more with Billy because I, I mean, I just think it's like when you're that autistic, when you're like that, the kind of autistic where you're lucid enough to write sentences that make sense, but you're that detached from reality, you're constantly like stuck in this like never ending role play. And that's sort of, I mean, that's the, the tragedy of Christian, right? That he, the whole world is just like a text based role play to him. But notice how he repeats a lot of key sentences, like my eyes, my body, my soul. Like he, they have this sort of tape loop attachment to certain, it becomes like a talismanic sentence to them. Like it's similar to Bob Hickman, like starting every single sentence with, um, how does he do the voice? God enter my body, lack like of body, same size, like me flowing into you and you flowing into me. And then it's like every single video he puts out, he puts out like 10 a day. And it's how it is, like, basically. So it's, I, I think for Chris, it's yeah. echolalia. Mm. I believe it's, echo, it's called echolalia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Hmm. What is echolalia exactly? Um, I believe it's a, it's a you know, symptom of autism where you love repetition. And, like, mm, just as yeah. much as you like routine in your day, you, you like, um, like, he'll call it random access humor, which is kind of the echolalia of, like, repeating jokes that, 
have no place in the conversation from like Family Guy, where he'll just say something, you know, something from Vandy, Family Guy randomly. Mm. Well, this is kind of like what Turkey Tom was talking about with uh, that guy in his school who would drop these things about, uh, you know, what was it, uh, 4chan and uh, Chris Chan, you know, after... Uh, you know, expecting people not to know who this is and be like the edgy kid. You know, it's like it 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 does come from the sense of wanting to be a tryhard, wanting to put something out there that in your mind would uh you know garner all of this attention. But is is this a uniquely male phenomenon though? I mean, I'd imagine so. But I don't know. I would say not. I would say girls definitely do it too. Probably probably to a lesser extent. Mm. Um, but I've definitely known. <laughs> I mean, you know the. The, the Isabella Janky type girl, right? Oh, or, yeah. Um, oh, let's yeah. say the, the, the same type of girl who, I think we talked about this yeah, last yeah. stream. Pick she me. Like, stole Pelosi's laptop. Um, yeah, the collie but, of uh, pick me's and, and sort of the girls. like the like glasses wearing, you know, tight sweater uh, and jeans and like Jansport backpack t pick me girl who girls look uh, better in a t real tight sweater. They do, but they always have to like have they always have to uh, kind of be outgoing in that way and mm. have their like input on whatever conversations going on. I remember there was a girl I knew in high school like that, where like anytime I'd be talking with my friends about something, she'd have to be one of the boys and hop in there. And I remember just, oh, yeah. you stupid bitch, get out. Um, I mean, I didn't say that, but I definitely thought it. Uh, yeah. It's a uh, it's very strange though when you have somebody like Janky who just as far as her physicality goes, she's pretty well endowed. I mean, if we're being quite honest here, she does not have a giant scar in her face or something, you know, like she, if she, well, she does rotten toenails. Well, no, but yeah, that's, well, there's this, right. yeah, it's funny though. Cause there's this video of her outside her college when she's with like a bunch of people, there's like a crowd gathered and she's like engaged in some like debate with some guy over oh, like, street politics preacher. or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, and like, like that's the kind of person she is, you know, uh, and she doesn't do it for any like notoriety or like gain in terms of like pure metrics. Like she, she wanted to be anonymous online. Um, she just does it. It's mm. her own like enjoyment. Do, you, do know? you remember what she was talking about during that debate? Because I don't at all. It's funny. Cause like, I think she was arguing with the street preacher, but it's, it's crazy. Cause she like presents herself as like literal, like online fash, um, you know, uh, smear smear the like 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 total she's like a sun and rad girl yeah, yeah. sun rad yeah like trad thought um not trad thought but like like i remember those really crazy alt-right schizo e-girls that would post like they would bake like sun or red pies they would make the thing wait what but, is um, what is sun or rad for the people who don't know the which black is... sun oh uh, right, 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 right yes black sun. yes so th th so they would um I remember reading this <laughs> elaborate article, but it was like a total hit piece. It was from Motherboard about alt right women and how they're like basically like it's basically like a two thousand word essay on how they're pick me's. Mm. But it's <laughs> funny. <laughs> but, but, do, but do you think this has anything to do with her upbringing, I mean, with it, with her parents? You know, her father being uh, you know working for the federal government, like being a well, Navy no, SEAL, if, and her mother being a pilot, and you know then Secret Service and all well, that. I think. Like, I think like a lot of uh, there there are like genuine traditional women and there are like genuine like alt right women who are concerned about their race or whatever. But I think that with Janky, it seems like again it could just be the LARP for attention, or it could just be that she's taken a lot of the like, for lack of a better term, like turf criticisms, mm. and like construed it into this personal narrative of like. I'm going to target these people for like, because I myself feel like my sense of self is threatened mm. by it. I don't, I well, don't know. I think like the fact that like, her parents are glowies, like, I mean, if you look at the state of the current American military, I hate to say it, but they're probably, um, their parents probably have gotten into some heat for her, like targeting trans mm. people. Like, that I, is I'm kind of interesting to me though. I, um, during the janky leaks, I remember going through her, uh, I guess this is more like kind of anecdotal gossip than anything, but mm. uh, going through the leaks and one of them was like a screenshot she had taken of like her, her cash app history. Uh, oh, and it was like her stepmom, like every other day it was like, here's $300. And I remember seeing that being like, damn, yeah. I like, you know, <laughs> you. like, I hope you die. Uh, whoa, whoa, girl, whoa. Turkey Tom, we're on YouTube. We in Minecraft. This girl, yes. uh, sorry, this girl did not have a job. This girl like had nothing in the way of like a work ethic. Like she had no desire for that. 
her parents totally just coddled her and supported her like doing this degenerate shit online uh whether they knew the full extent of it like they knew she wasn't really trying to you know she wasn't having any like struggle any perseverance uh and well, so well i mean know, my she, parents she... enable me being uh mike's but bullshit online but well I mean... <laughs> but, do, but do you guys <laughs> do you guys think that there may be something i mean this may be a stretch but if you take the energy that a lot of people are online feeling towards the establishment you know whatever conspiracy theories people happen to have they assume the very worst about the people who are within the intelligence apparatus within you know the top of the hierarchy and that's where we get all these various theories about all of this unspeakable horror that goes on behind the scenes at these parties and so on and so forth when we look at somebody like janky do you think that some connection can possibly be made here to there being like a certain type of person that would kind of like, because of that kind of upbringing, become exactly what the people online fear the elites uh, are? Or is that too much of a stretch? Or is it kind of like a mix of like some people are like Maybe that? Maybe they're and... just actually... Uh... The thing I'm trying to Maybe figure out goblins. is like, <laughs> like was she was she like just... I mean, obviously, we don't know. This is all completely speculative. We know, like, basically nothing about her upbringing. But apart from, like, you know, her parents' backgrounds, we're like, like, why is she like this? Why is she into, like, you know, the weird fetish shit? Why is she so twisted? Well, I mean, like, not, not to let anybody off the hook or anything, but having parents that are high-ranking intelligence officials, even if it doesn't directly connect her to psychological warfare and you know, pedophile rings, it still probably means that Janky has emotionally stunted and disconnected parents who were never fucking around, yeah. which, you know, would make perfect sense why said person is a total fucking whack job on the internet. You know, sometimes, you know, absentee parents fuck their kids up. Not just absentee parents in the case of latchkey kids from poor neighborhoods, but specifically rich absentee parents. There's no sense of responsibility. Distant, uh... cold, absent, disinterested parents. Yeah. But a lot of money. A lot of money to spend in in place of but, there but being any affection. The, sc the scatological aspect of it no, is very interesting. And also me. bourgeois like parents like that. Like the the psychological issues that like aristocratic kids with like fucked up parents uh like absent like emotionally distant parents is like different than i think like you know growing up with absentee parents mm. in a working class environment where they're still stressing on survival etc it's just like this kid's got a lot of money and a mm. lot of time and way too much time to like morbidly self-reflect it's morbid yeah. self-attention that creates this yeah. like disintegration of the psyche well Notice it's kind of like a matt forney has a good comment about this as well so he mm, says say why is a rich glow spawn mentally ill the question answers itself you know <laughs> you know that many you know that many antifa are the children of government officials bella is the right-wing version of that in europe they get off literally and they actually know people in um, certain Scandinavian countries, there's been cases where the, the the police like give information to Antifa groups to then go, then they get off the hook when they go and do vandalism mm. against supposed fascists. Well, who actually, because I know there are, I mean, let's be honest, Geo, there are fascist uh, groups within Europe. I don't remember where I read this, but uh, somebody was talking about how they anticipate that these far-right fascist groups actually have much more of a... Uh, uh, much more of a way of growing within Europe as opposed to the United States, where the Christendom they, of the U.S. kind of separates it from being able to accept more of the pagan Hitleristic vibe that uh, yeah. we saw in Germany in the uh, you know in the 1930s and they, 40s. They have more. They have more organization. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. No, uh, I'm no they they have more organizational skills and they generally have a stronger connection to their sense of identity than the average like american right winger so i think if they were to allow them to uh gain any like for example in the early 2000s i remember keith woods was talking about this i th was it the golden dawn or was it no it was the party it was the far right party in denmark that had like almost 30 percent of the vote and the eu just like banned them mm. was that they was that the one with the green icon 
I like how I, they. I don't think it was the Jerk or, or was Wilders. Was that Norway? One. I think it was... No, 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 not Jerk Wilders. No, that was There's Norway. some organization that used the color green. I just found that funny. It's like, oh, the red's been used too much. Let's just use the color <laughs> green now. You know. But, but this like, yeah. But that's a side point. Um, this connection between the scatological element of the perversions of Janky and her like upper class like you know worldview and upbringing it's like there's very much like a disadian like you know the fellini yeah like the violation and the dirt and this disgusting waste the excess is like this crazy like battalion eroticism where you are of the most like sanitized upper class you are like the brahmins of the world you have like the most amount of money and resources and you can shower every day Right. But now mm. it's like you're fucking having toe fungus and you're eating, mm. you know, I'm right. smelling your cash <laughs> yet. Like, you by know. the way, the, here's an article from PubMed that I just uh, found right now because I remembered this and by no means am I insinuating Wait, this. Go ahead, Adam. Well, well yeah. I was just going to say that the bourgeois, like the aristocrats, they have to go a little harder to expel the solar anus or whatever. They have yeah. to, they have to, like, <laughs> more extreme sexual <laughs> violence to expel that energy oh, yeah. whereas people who you know work for a living experience abjection just trying to get by you know so like that was marquis de sade's whole thing that mm. all this time all this wealth all this it, it, you know, all this simplicity it needs to be like exercised in these acts of extreme transgression oh yeah and I'm curious, Adam, what do you think of this uh, PubMed article over here that I just linked to? Because I remember this uh, before somebody was talking about it where, and by no means do I insinuate that this is her particular case, you know, but just like in general, when we're talking about fecal soiling, things of like that, like when it comes to something that may have happened, you know, horrible thing in one's childhood, um, do you think that there may be a connection there? Or is that to, um, you know, just like how how much is it linked specifically to, you know, uh, abuse during childhood as opposed to just something that people end up picking up as a fetish along the way? Sorry, pal. Where did you link it? Oh, it was in the uh, chat over here. So there was an article from PubMed. Uh, it's called The Relevance of Fecal Soiling as an Indicator of Child Sexual Abuse, a Preliminary Analysis. Oh. So I don't remember where I read this uh, first, but... It is an interesting thing to think about, like, if you're talking about why do people develop a lot of these paraf uh, paraphilias? How much does that come from one's experience, not just... Uh, and again, I'm not insinuating that that's, that's her situation at all. There is nothing that I know about her particular situation. But in general, is this something that happens often with people who uh, get abused like that, that they do end up developing these uh, uh, paraphilias over time, specifically related to, uh, like, feces and things of that nature? Well, one thing that would be interesting to me about this kind of this kind of idea is that you know we have this term anal retentive. Um, it just means you're like very wound up, you know. So if someone you know shits themselves compulsively, it could mean that they are you know bottling up something bottling up a secret or you know a trauma that is so overwhelming there's only one way that it can come out mm. um this is like a really i'm like kind of grossed out just talking about this also a little sad and depressed but i'm sure you know uh the infliction of abuse on children manifests in all kinds of fucked up ways uh, in their adult lives, and I don't think really anything can be off the table in that regard. Well, I'm looking at Turkey Tom's video, where like the one part near the end where he's reading the Kiwi Farms thread, it's like it's a disgusting rancid piss scent. It's like oh god, but another, like mm. part of the video that that Turkey Tom did, um, that covered like um, which I thought was pretty brave of you, you you covered uh, Janky's like perverse lesbianic sexual sadism. Highest rates of domestic violence among all couples. Oh God! Um, Is that real? I didn't know that. It's yeah, statistically, it's true among all the couples. Apparently, lesbian relationships. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, Janky in particular is strange because you know, there's like almost a cognitive dissonance. I wonder if she ever acknowledged where like she, 
you know, calls herself like a Nazi and she wants to like purge, you know, degenerates and whatever. Um, supposedly she was like, you know, creating a list of trans people on campus that she could harass. There was some allegation early on. I don't know if that was substantiated about her, like, and her friends, like, you know, trying to find this trans person on discord and who later killed themselves, um, as a mm. result of harassment or something. So, you know, there's all this stuff, but at the same time, Isabella herself is a lesbian. She's engaging in all this shit. We're like, you know, if you're bullying people online regularly, certainly you can't be be like, oh, you I, know, the the the, yeah. the base P sniffer, you know, like you're not you're not gonna be thinking that's like a cool <laughs> yeah. thing. But, I feel but, like... but but yeah, for her, it's like, you know, she wants to bully people. She's like, oh, I'm owning retards online. And simultaneously, she's like engaging in this weird, like gross shit mm, that yeah. you think would be typical of like some like eccentric yeah, bull cow behavior. But, but isn't that a bit like uh, that uh, Christian preacher who was preaching against gay people and then was caught with a uh, gay prostitute snorting coke? Is it like one of those things? No, where no, 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 no. That's no? The, it's it's. It's a very common theme. I know it's probably like shit lib propaganda, but Adam, you know this. In pop, in certain literary works or even in pop culture, there's like this connection between the like particularly gay and lesbian um, like act and this expression of power among various like fascist or totalitarian regimes. There's always like this subtext in literature where it's like, oh, the actual based fascist is like they are the real like subversive degenerate whatever is right like i think it's probably a trope but there is this connection between this sexual sadism and this very primitive and uh unsophisticated view janky has of like being like the base trad right wing i think like there's something there could, but uh, could, could I, it be like wanting to punish uh uh oneself in a way by punishing others who exhibit the same thing it that... could be it could be because like for example, like it almost reminds me of like again another Oz reference, but it reminds me of Vern Schillinger in Oz, who is like this homophobic leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, but yeah. yet he himself is with like Prags, like Beecher, and yeah, he's, he's like a sexual like, sadist. Yeah, he's a swastika on his ass. In the yeah, <laughs> Beecher's ass. Yeah. Episode one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then he's like, uh, like so it reminds me a lot of like a pop culture depictions of like the. The totalitarian being the real sexual status but i wanted to get default friend i wanted to get your like uh, hot spicy take on um the e-girl dimension here the yeah. pick me dimension i wonder like as the only femoid on this podcast right now that's <laughs> oh man i didn't even <laughs> it didn't even register to me i mean <laughs> that's why you're in the center in the zoom screen <laughs> i think it's different for everyone right um it's, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I, I, I'm going to say that I don't know if it's like a, a female specific thing, but I find that when you're online too much, it creates this weird like myopia where like even if you are even if you are someone who grew up with values and like in your real life, you have values, whatever is going on in cyberspace does something weird to your brain that like strips away your ability to behave in a normal way. Like your yeah. brain really becomes fried. And, you know, I feel like I've met women like this in real life where it's just like they live in just like squalor and like they've they've gotten so many like, um, you know, body modifications. It rises to a level of like self mutilation. And I really think it's because of the Internet. It's just because they don't like re they don't exist physically enough. And it just mm -hmm. that's it, it does. It, but I mean, this has happened to Chris Chan, too. Like, it, I don't think it's a it's a woman specific thing. Mm. Damn, I wanted to, like I wanted to ask Gio, you're, you're an artist. You're kind of in the, uh, I was going to say on the, on the damn bitch, you live like this. You kind of hit it there. You know, that, that picture of the like neat girl that's been going around of like the disgusting, like R9 K bedroom. Um, oh, it's like, um, it's that came art. from the Wojak, like the, the, the princess Wojak. Yeah. Hold up. I got to send you this one. Um, oh, please, please. I have a link to it. Put it in I'll, the... I'll actually, I'll put it in the chat here. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah. saw this picture. Um, you know, Adam, Adam right here, he's a very prolific art critic as well. So he, um, I, I wanted to, add, maybe we should do something about the Met Gal, Adam, and um, Woodstock. We should do an episode because I, I wrote this piece actually that might be, um, you know, I, it might be featured like fingers crossed in a bigger publication mm. in like the spectator maybe. So, oh, um, nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, 
because they're looking for an art critic so i'm like well mm. i i put i floated your name as well oh oh this fucking image oh even with the school shooter shirt. i know <laughs> oh my god that's what i'm saying i've been in rooms like this like many like oh, several god. times during my life uh just by hanging out with like the sort of who um, who more, is like, the weird, anime girl uh, that i keep seeing in the corner um uh, i think she's from Ev Evangelion. Evangelion, yeah, yeah. Asuka. Evangelion, yeah. Asuka, yeah. 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 Not the wrestler Asuka. Yeah. By the way, Suka, uh, Suka means bitch in Russian, by the way. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, here. Suka bleat! Yeah. On the topic of Woodstock, though, um, recently, did you see uh, HBO did a documentary yeah, about yeah, Woodstock 99? Yeah. Oh, it pissed Have me you off watched so it? Oh, my God. It was, it was terrible. terrible. You know, I, it was really bad. Yeah. I don't, I don't really understand. I met um, Wesley Morris once, and he called me the movie Gone Girl had just come out and I only met this guy for 10 minutes. And within that 10 minutes, Gone Girl managed to come up and Wesley Morris managed to chide me as being a misogynist for simply saying, I thought it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> that guy fucking sucks, dude. Like, you know what the, the movie, most... the movie itself or the, sorry, the documentary was so bad uh, in particular with like, there's this, I'll bring up cognitive dissonance again. There's like this huge contradiction with these people where like they spend a good amount of the beginning of the documentary, like praising rap music. They're like, yeah. Oh, you know, uh, DMX was there and we love DMX. Uh, <laughs> it's like, have you, have you read what? any DMX lyrics? Like, I like know. he says blood on my dick. Cause I fucked a corpse. Like that yeah. is like not that. only that, but he has like, he, what, he has some song reason. He's like, I hate this. I guess F Turkey. Or, yeah. Turkey uh, Tom you know, YouTube. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not, I wasn't going to say it out loud. You know, I'm protecting you. Thank you. you. That green dollar sign. But yeah. So I mean, <laughs> just seeing that and then like, like, okay. I admittedly, you know, I wasn't alive when new metal was becoming a thing. Hmm. Uh, I was born at like kind of the tail end of like the fad, I guess. Um, but like, I, I guess from, you know, listening to some of the more popular artists from around there, especially, you know, the one they target seems to be Limp Bizkit. Um, mm. I guess, you know, Fred himself is kind of like, just like a douche, kind of a frat guy. Um, but I mean, apart from that, like, is there any like misogyny in any of that? Like, you know, I've listened to, uh, the first three Limp Bizkit albums. I don't really understand mm. this, like this angry white guy, like yeah. he's just like singing pop songs about like being like sad or like being angry <laughs> or you're wanting pussy like by yeah, the way since uh, since starting to watch sopranos again i found this great account on facebook apparently it's on twitter as well aj sopranos new metal shirts so oh, yeah. <laughs> love slipknot yeah yeah, slipknot. yeah i love that shit okay. there's a scene when uh Old chamber oh my yeah. there there was a poster of demanufacture by fear factory in the yeah, one yeah, the like, club. It's so new metal like oh man that's a little new metal wigger style <laughs> well there's this scene in that in that show i think it's during season one when aj's trying to do his homework and he's trying to read that that one robert frost poem it's really famous about oh, yeah, like yeah. a fork in the road or, or it was like through in the snow or something like that um yeah and uh and meadow comes in and she's like he, he's playing slipknot he's blasting eyeless <laughs> and she's like turn that shit down <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. i mean no wonder he got bad this was probably one of jory jordanson's best like that was like a good display of his drumming. Oh my god! Even that <laughs> from the fucking from the Great there's Southern this, Trend Kill tour. Oh there's this god. one where he's got a Pantera like weed shirt. On his <laughs> oh, I remember the Pantera so weed shirt. So oh, that was awesome. That's amazing. Love to see if I could find it. I know. But that... you know what the most revealing thing about the Woodstock documentary was? At the very end, they fucking praise Coach. Oh, you look like a Puerto Rican whore. You and your baby. Oh, Filio Tower. R.I.P. Frank Vincent. That's oh like R.I.P. style. <laughs> but at the very end, they fucking praise Coach uh, as like the acceptable progressive, like for like the fact that they had to split up like early '90s, like sensitive quiet um like shoegaze going into nirvana and like uh fugazi like then the second half was like new metal it's like bro have you listened to the output of early 90s death metal that is like like pierce from within comes to mind you know it's like this shit is so fucking crazy and the fact that they had to like lambast dmx 
as like this terrible like what about the the few black people that went their friends singing the n-word oh, oh my god we weren't fucking middle class pussies like you are <laughs> yeah. like they didn't give a fuck they were having a good time oh, fuck. no but like the thing is at the time it was viewed as like this act of like racial harmony that like everyone now is into rap music everyone oh. is into gangster rap yeah, so it's watch. like hmm Garuga, yeah, is that the Garuga Mesh kid? Yeah, now you can't do that though. Have you guys yeah, seen that one video that. of like some white chick got like invited Kendrick on the Lamar. stage? With, I think I think it was was it Kendrick or Drake? Yes, I don't remember. It was Kendrick. But Lamar. but but she's rapping and she like says the M word. Like you can tell she kind of doesn't know if she wants to say it, and then she says it, and everyone's like, <gasps> then, then he like, stops. Then, it. Yeah, he stops. He's like he's like yo yo yo, you can't do that. That's not cool. It's like bro, fuck <laughs> off. Like, you know, I have really... I have like a lot to say about the Woodstock '99 documentary, but. I'll, I'll try and keep it brief, but I thought the fucking hand wringing about DMX was absurd. Almost like they're blaming his getting, uh, you know, getting the kids to rap the N word along with him. Like they're blaming that on the riots and not like the pith and shit floating around the goddamn mud or the lack of water and food for 48 hours. Um, and also just like new metal was like, emo like kind of it was like jonathan davis was like rap was like like wigger sing rapping about being like sexually abused like being a poor kid in fucking bakersfield yeah. <laughs> i'm just I imagining like Corey taylor on stage yeah. like i got molested yeah. like, by the way Phil philip daniels got the best take on rap i think because philip daniels a wonderful classical composer he says most rap is hokey pokey cringe it's so boring oh <laughs> very depressing that it's become the new high culture i mean i like some rap i mean very kind of mainstream Stream like Tupac, Biggie, but like, Easy E, but I don't really like that but much. Let's of it. look. At, let's look at that set that Corn did. They were the first heavy band to go on. They ripped. They ripped. Like that set is the best live recording of Corn. I yeah. listened to the one version of Adidas so much. I even know when the mic cuts out on <laughs> Dave Silvera's drum kit. It's yeah. like, <laughs> like well, that. Like that song, Adidas. That was like. If your life sucks, if you're like a lower class, working class bum that has no future, your fucking future's been robbed from you. Yeah. What do you have? You have fucking. That's pretty much yeah. it. And now we don't even have that. We have incels now and fem cells. Yeah. Mm. And I'm not, so it's like. No, but as far as the things that are being. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I'm not even. Like, I'm not like still a tremendous fan of new metal, but I do kind of appreciate it because it was through new metal you know because i used to subscribe to terrorizer magazine because like I, and the first issue i got was flipknot was on the cover but then that brought me to like you know mayhem and carcass and you know entombed and then you know later on more Ooh, on nice. and extreme stuff so i still am like i'm glad i was a new metal kid when i was young but watching that corn footage reminded me that if the branding wasn't so kind of mass market, they really did do some interesting things. Oh, Literally, yeah. Like the guitar playing is totally unique. And Sonically, yes. Yeah, yeah, like it's insane. And those motherfuckers played their dicks off. Like every set, you like Jonathan Davis seems like he almost died you know yeah <laughs> like, like it, even it, in the fact that like head was out of his mind on smack that he yeah. couldn't remember playing like he hit everything perfectly because people don't know this head is actually was the real driving force behind corn sound he was the one that brought in the eight string guitar he was the one that was primarily experimenting with a lot of different pedals of course nowadays everyone in metal uses a fucking fractal axe effects it's not the you know yeah. but like that that for the time the fact that they were willing to like push the limits with the just sonically um those first few the first four albums of corn like to me like that's such a that's iconic mm. you know that's i don't know i never i never listened to corn or new metal the whole thing is just not that interesting to me uh growing up so do you think that it's still too late or could i could i still get into it or do you I think it's like I a time like, like a time that's passed go to the main bands just for like the reference point don't you don't have to like go deep into it there's like 20 new metal bands that sound like 
like emo wicker and pearl jam. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but uh like i'd say like the top bands corn especially deftones uh definitely Bloodvein, oh, the mm. yeah like the, the slipknot like the they did some interesting stuff i mean like mm. what about Limp what Biscuit? about dope we can't forget dope. I, I listened i i saw dope live with uh black label society it was mm. it was amazing but <laughs> this limp right. biscuit snooki is the only one that i listened to is that a new metal song oh, yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah. All right, I did like that. I remember that, that girl like, in the car. Do you remember that Italian-looking girl in the car oh, that was looking yeah. at Limp Bizkit walking down the street, and then she went out of the car? You remember her? She, oh, I like God. her. You I know, remember, like, um. Oh, sorry, Adam. Go ahead. I was just thinking too. Like, I think a lot of the new metal stuff. They were just like really. They were just like you know poor like suburban, mostly yeah. white kids that were like really into what was going on in rap in the mid nineties, especially oh, yeah. stuff like Mob Deep and Wu-Tang Clan that to this day, I mean, Wu-Tang is basically like theory fiction. It's really kind of mind blowing once you get into that stuff. And I think they were just like, let's make this like loud rock music that's kind of soundscapey, but also has hook yeah. grooves like you can kind of dance to it if you wanted to. It's 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 all good. And Pantera was, I think, the linchpin of a lot of those new metal kids like discovering yeah. the more heavier sound. Yeah. Because um, totally. like during the early '90s, like they were the ones. Like, okay, here's the thing: in the early '90s, metal was still like it evolved. It became like prog and like more art form, <laughs> like art type of metal. Like like Cynics Focus comes to mind. But like during the '90s, like Pantera was the one that like really kept metal in the consciousness of most people because, like, I personally don't think like this whole bullshit about oh you know like Nirvana killed glam. Like in some ways, yes, but it was more of just glam could never exist apart from like the 1980s. Like, well, Billy, you, you're an expert in this because you're uh, this was you your uh, forte growing up, so maybe you could comment mm. on. Oh, and here is the girl, by the mm -hmm. way. Look at her. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, also, pretty. just like you can't do Motley Crue forever, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, but, you know, I, like every genre, you know, every like big blow up, it's got like 10 years, maybe like max. And then, you know, something else comes along. I don't think that. Yeah. Hmm. And metal, too, is the one guitar music since the 1990s that has retained any kind of modernism. Like, yeah, you know, there's still amazing shit that comes out all the time and it still kind of stretches itself out artistically and sonically in a way that um definitely punk and post-punk and all these other sorts of mm. rock and roll music to come out after the 1980s just did not well yeah. sp speaking of sonically christian uh, had a uh, band as well Christian and, the Hedgehog Christian and the Hedgehog Boys. I think that was yeah, like the Chris, first yeah. the first iteration of Sonichu. I think that may have been even before the comic. Because it was it was in his um high school uh art like what was it art class contest or something like he had to do Yeah, it was yeah, a virtual band before. formed and fronted by Chris. In his head helping him compose the music was Sonichu and the rest of the gang. In reality, there wasn't the band. The albums consisted entirely of Chris poorly recording himself shouting awful parody lyrics about his shitty life over copyrighted pop music, which according to him, qualifies as new and unique compositions. I just, like, I remember listening to Default's podcast and she was describing... Um, like in the early two thousands, like the edgy, like out, like like loser, like kind of loser, like kid that was somehow hot, like playing video games in his messy room and like going on MySpace, and I just uh, could picture him probably listening to like MySpace metal, like Job for a Cowboy, like in Tomb of a Machine while he's playing fucking Call of Duty. He's listening <laughs> to Breaking Benjamin. <laughs> yeah, he's Benjamin. listening to yeah, hmm. or like Hybrid to that, one, that one song they have fucking. Let's give this another try. Oh you know yeah, my favorite was uh from the that first one the one they album. Did for Halo. Yeah, Firefly. That's another great one. Cause like you download it from some wrestling music video, you have like fucking. Drowning Pool, <laughs> Breaking Benjamin. <laughs> oh, shit. 
Well, the guy I knew like this, he lied to me and he said that he liked the Pixies. And then like, <laughs> as our, the, the day our friendship ended in this like melodramatic way, he like he came out and he was like, I hate the Pixies. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and one more thing. I hate the pe- fucking Pixies. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that's amazing. But so, um, yeah, go ahead, Billy. Yeah. So most of Christian and the Hedgehog boys, you can't really hear Chris Chan, even if you wanted, for, you know, wanted to listen for the lulls. But Virgin with Rage, I would iconic. say, qualifies as, I mean, it's like, um, you know, that Rebecca Black song Friday, where it's like, <laughs> so bad, so bad, so bad. It, it becomes, at some point, it gets good. And it's like, this is like, um, like this almost like super ironic, hyper ironic art. Mm. And I mean, Virgin with Rage, is he not the first incel? I think oh, yeah. again qualifies as the first of a lot of different things, but incel is one of them. I mean, just if it were a song about wanting a girlfriend, that's boring. Yeah. But when he had that line, I'm just a virgin with rage. It, <laughs> yeah. I well, mean, w- well, here here's the song, and actually, just like we did before with the uh, what you call it. Hey, with- look at me! I'm sad and lonely, <laughs> without a fire. But I desire to not hear you say you say I want it that way. As I said, ladies walking <laughs> along one by one. I never want to hear I have a boyfriend. I never want to hear I yeah. have a boyfriend. <laughs> Tell, Tell me, me why. why. I'm stuck, I'm stuck as a virgin, virgin with rage. rage. Tell me why, so I need I can't a, cute be a cute girl. girl, girl my age. My age. <laughs> I love that line so much because even in his song, he wants to, you know, use it, yeah. use his opportunity as a little minor attraction sign. So it's like he's not just looking for a cute girl. Just let's get a little more specific. A cute girl my age. Yeah. 18 to 24. Why do all the jerks get all the pretty girls? Yeah, you may not know this, but you should know that I am alone, alone some heart, and I have no fire, but I desire not to hear you say I have a boyfriend stuck as a virgin. Oh, like, I never... <laughs> like, that is just... It's it's literally, I'm looking at outsider art. I'm looking at Henry yes. Darger. I'm Absolutely. looking... Who is that prisoner that did the... um? weird portraits i mean there's a few of them like john wayne gacy but there was also um was it henry lucas that did like the uh the clown no no that was gacy no, that, that's gacy mm. yeah but there was another one that did the uh um, another the cats. oh mm. god there was like these weird psychedelic cats oh i know the ones you're talking about yeah. let me uh, let me find them for you i there, thought that there... was like a russian it, it has a russian style to it but i know it's not yeah russian. Yeah, it's got a decorative style to it. I love the, like, I guess it's a bridge. I don't know, song structure where it's like, to not, to not, to not. Because <laughs> he, like, he's got to get the rage in there. It's not just, it's not enough to say it. <laughs> like, like smashing mm. pumpkins tonight, tonight. Here, here <laughs> are the uh, cats. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, my God. That's I love um, I love uh, this. Uh, how do you even describe this expression? Not even the psychedelic one, although that one's great too. But just this smirk, <laughs> this, smirk, yeah, cross armed, <laughs> silly ass <laughs> cat on the side here. No, but, this, um, this is great art. This is art after my own heart. But it's fun. Like I about the janky thing though. We were talking about e girls. I think that um, a lot of people say like the delicious irony of like Chris being done in by a like a boyfriend free girl. I think I th- I think um, it's it's interesting how like what Default was saying about the internet does like warp your perception of reality. I think it's more of like this really weird negative feedback loop where you have to sort of push the extremes in order to um, because like I I remember my my friend um my friend on Twitter Impossible Princess she was she did this podcast with Jana where she talks about like how the e-girl of like yesteryear of the early internet was like an anonymous sad poster was like the confessional was like the big thing. Yes. Was, On, yeah. um, before live journal, there was a, um, oh, there was some kind of diary yeah. site. Yeah. 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 They were talking well, about that. Wait, was that Exanga? Is that what it was called? Not Exanga. No, oh, it man. was, um, I think diary was in the name of it. There was other ones. There was like 6,000 secrets yeah. or whatever. Um, I also love this comment from Hyper Bowl about that psychedelic cat, but like the one with the arms crossed. He writes, smug poop. 
That's what I imagine. Oh, smart is going. <laughs> but now the e-girl has to take on this almost, I would say, in the one end, it's like a pastiche of like the male gaze and like specifically media through the internet. But on the other end, it's this very like almost hyper masculinized like shit poster. I'm like the I'm like I'm not just a cool girl, but now I'm such a cool girl that I'm dictating the culture around me. It's very much like wearing the hideous like sadistic mask. It's like what Paglia called the female transvestite in uh, in sexual persona, like the female um, aesthetic esthete that is a debaucher. They're the ones who the, their form of transgression takes on this like weird caricature of male transgression, which yeah. I think is like cr pretty crazy how a lot of like the e girls um, and the one like, and this is what my friend impossible princess on Twitter said on the one end, they're like even older now they're like aging millennial women, but they still have this like weird mask of being young and youthful and innocent. It's like, mm. ooh, woo, like, the well, ooh, woo, like what does Brittany Venti say? Ooh, woo, like that's no, but Gio, to ooh, be fair, girls, isn't, right? that, isn't that all women or no, and not all women, but it's like, isn't that most women that do want to retain their youth? I mean, it would usually be, but no, but this not... is different. This is like a specific no, well, 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 the default front, for example, oh, yeah, ahead, would anybody ahead. ever like, would, ever, would it ever be considered a compliment for a guy to say that, oh, you look older than however, but you know what I mean? Like, General, I mean, like, yeah. people, you know, I, I, I get, like, a, attacked a lot. And one of people's favorite insults to me is that I'm a 35-year-old grad student. And I mean, like, people know I'm in my 20s, right? But, like, that's how they, I mean, it, and it gets to me. They, it gets to any woman. That's mm. the, that's, yeah. no woman wants to hear they're 35, even if they are yeah. 35. And it's how people attack <laughs> like on that day, too. By the way, there, there was an amazing <laughs> sketch from the man show uh, back when, uh, you know, Adam Crow, well, uh, Jimmy Kimmel was, uh, you know, not who he is today. But there was this wonderful man show sketch where they had this character, the man show boy, which was like this chubby boy scout. And he was supposed to uh, get like find old ladies to cross the street with. And he went to like, like 30 and 40 year old women. And he said, like, can I help you cross the street? You know, because you're an old lady. And uh, <laughs> the, like the, the faces that they had, you know, like they just turned red. <laughs> There's an like, old lady. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, there was this one tweet the other day about how like um, Zoomer girls, their fashion sense now is dressing like their moms did in the 90s. I thought that was hilarious. I saw this woman crossing the street the other day that had like the waist high jeans, acid wash, and like the white sneaker tennis shoes and the cardigan. I'm like, holy shit, that makes sense. But it's like... It's like in one end, um, the Zoomer and millennial woman, they want to be their mothers, but something is preventing them. It's an ironic aesthetic. Mm. It's like, I want to be what my mom was in the 90s when they were raising me. Like when, you know, we were poor and we didn't have the typical bourgeois fucking lifestyle. But it's like mm. this weird, like, kind of caricature of it. I don't I don't know. Well, well like, to Turkey, Tom, I don't what know. is going on like uh, in... Turkey, in what your... is the women around you? What's yeah. the aesthetic sensibility of the Zoomer girls? Um, I mean, definitely the girls I'm talking to are not desirable, stable people there. You know, I'm a, I'm a man who paints his nails, so I'm definitely going to be attracting a certain <laughs> archetype. I mean, you, you know, go. the song, the BPD and Ecstasy song, I mean, those are exactly the types of girls that are attracted to me. And uh, <laughs> frankly, I'm the type of guy that's attracted back. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it is for now. I mean, really, there's like two options if you're if you're uh, a Zoomer white girl anyway. It's like you can either be like the Lululemon yoga pants uh or and and athleta you know um probably like starbucks drinking kind of meme that kind of girl you know blonde highlights in your hair um airpods in at all times including when you're giving head or you can be um you can be kind of this like e-girl dyed hair you know that kind of thing i guess within each there's like you know different subsets we could get into but those are probably the two paths for a white chick and the, and the first uh, yeah. path that would be the one that right now would be putting on the uggs and going like full pumpkin spice would it's, that be it's the, really uh, just millennial uh, yeah. like millennial and i must fashion. say though yeah. i must say the pumpkin spice you know it is it is pretty good from starbucks i do recommend oh, yeah. it 
I do highly recommend that that beverage. But yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I just uh, <laughs> I've I've always been I've always been attracted to the the ones that are insane, and that's just the alternative schizo e girl. <laughs> How many girls in your school would you say have a uh, colored hair? Um, every second one. I mean, do you mean do you mean colored as in like dyed in general, yeah. or co- like a, like yeah. a strange color? Because because there are girls who will who will have like blonde hair, they dye it brown. Or whatever. No, I wouldn't count that. I would like when I say yeah, colored hair. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bing, I don't know. Neon. I mean, it might be like it might be like ten percent hmm. of girls, maybe fifteen. I would have. Yeah, I mean, I mean this, is a... where there, this is where there's a disconnect between very online and real life. I mean, very online, you're gonna say like, what were what what percentage were you guys expecting? Thirty uh, percent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you spend a lot of time online, you're gonna think it's a lot more. I'd no, say, it's I mean, not even. You know, it's not even the online thing. My ex girlfriend, uh, my second Chinese ex girlfriend, she had like oh, dyed God. hair. But oh, that's, God. but that is kind of like a thing though. Like my second hair Chinese. Is kind of like a... <laughs> she was the second Chinese one, oh. not included with the other girlfriend. She's one of the Chinese. Yeah, love, I mean, love. what is with Jewish guys going with black women? What is that? I I did have sort of a. I had a black professor who was hundred percent Eskenazi who was dating a woman uh, who married a woman I think yeah. from Ghana, and she was a math professor as well. So they were both. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there was this, there was this cute black receptionist who I met when I was going to this medical clinic, and I was really really high. And for some reason, she gave me uh, her uh, phone number, and I was just like all high and fucked up. And it was know, a confidence. Yeah, That's exactly. It... Yeah, being well, high gives you a lot of confidence. That is like Hesh in The Sopranos <laughs> had a black <laughs> wife that died from an aneurysm, this... and so like Tony gave him the money back. Yeah. Wait, like, actually, ahead, Adam, Adam, can you confirm what I said about being high gives confidence? Definitely. I Definitely. Mean, it depends, but yeah, I would say it makes you more conversational, and it gives you this air of being nonplussed, you know, joie de vivre, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, yeah. this Jew has a very strong preference. I think you know this, Gio, but I have a very, very strong preference for Asian women. Mm. No. Oh, yeah. You're and married to one. Thing again, I mean, it's not like any specific racial thing, but like my personal preference, I've dated mostly yeah but do you do you find that with uh, asian women there's because look the second girlfriend that i mentioned she was already like an americanized asian so it did not last that long of a time i'm somebody who's like more traditional in the sense that i value family and somebody like her she had a uh, big problem with her family where her family who was from china they were super restrictive and yeah. I think that's something mm-hmm. that caused her to push back on them and do as many drugs as she possibly could. And as a result, just get all get all screwed yeah. up. My lady, Michelle, uh, I'd say, I mean, her family is from, uh, she's, dad's from China, mom's from Burma. And the Burmese family, I'd say they took a lot of pride in, in, in integration. Like, um, and like an extraordinary amount, actually, they probably to the ch- kids' detriment didn't even teach them their traditional languages. But mm. and you know, Michelle, I think she, you know she partied and took drugs and shit. But so did I. And I don't think that means she like doesn't want to have kids or a family. I'm pretty sure she does. You mean she's not damaged? She has. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she has short hair. That's it. Person, you know, no more than me. Mm. But this is another topic I wanted to get into a default because Mm. default has come under heat recently for the like X, like sex posy millennial feminist stuff. And a lot of like regret specifically among older millennial women. And I wonder, like I had this video where I was sort of riffing up, but I have to do a follow up because I felt like I wasn't as articulate as, you know, I should have been about like, it's it's like in this weird sense there's this idea of like untouched purity that is more of like you know trads online go for but in the other sense in the wheat fields right geo yeah yeah but then there's like this redemption of it but yet at the same time i i'm skeptical of like this thing becoming a trend to where all of a sudden as soon as like millennial women hit 30 they're like oh fuck what do we do like i think I don't know. I'm I'm more jaded and cynical than that. I guess. I I don't know. I think. 
I think it, I like the the problem I see is that there's still an easy like um discourse in which you can meme upon that where it's like oh you're just bitter and resentful you're just to pick me blah 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 so I feel like a lot of uh women in particular online they're not going to buy into this thing of like regretting this like libertine sexuality because they have other people like when Liz Brunegg replied to default friend it was like the sea of like irony leftist fucking Grace Pogley what's her name uh the Chapo one you know oh, um, oh god the 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 yeah anyways mm. like you have a I'm sea just... of them like making like with pronouns in the bio mm. oh by the way speaking of Chapo, this... we are gonna have to get later on to that whole uh h3h3 meets uh hassan piker thing oh That's, god uh, oh, we're not gonna leave the stream without discussing I that I bag leftists more than any online contingent Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the discourse policing of the dirtbags is so, I mean, their whole function is to be like, you can be edgy up until this point. And if you cross that point, you're an irredeemable evil fascist, of course. Yeah. But I wonder, like, I remember one person responded to, I think, Mary Harrington. Mm. Saying, who like, who we are going to have like... on, by the way, uh, we were supposed to have her on. She is coming back later on in the, um, in the fall. Yeah. Um, saying like it's sexual fascism or some crap like that but but i think i i'm skeptical as a whole because there still is um a lot of the i don't see i don't know enough about the zoomer girls to know but from what i hear from people they still pretty much larp as like what us like millennials like the whole 2010 sexuality thing i wonder if they're going to break the cycle or if they're going to accelerate it in some way. To be honest ways. with you, to be honest with you, there is like a very sex positive view, I think, among a lot of Zoomer girls. But in terms of their actual like, like in practice, most yeah. of them are not, are not, you know, generally the type to like fuck a guy on the first date or sleep mm. around a ton. Like I would say like, you know, 70% to 80% of, of, of girls my age um, are not these like crazy, you know, hoes, you know, fucking every guy they meet, uh, that's just my experience um so hmm, although i do i do wonder is there any difference in terms of let's say girls who would be your age who grew up in the 90s as opposed to now not so much in terms of uh, sexual activity but more in terms of how they relate to the world like are we becoming as the conversation on btr goes a lot of times are we becoming more isolated because of the internet there's less uh face-to-face -face communication and that does something to a person like i don't know tom do you have any thoughts on that i mean i will say you know the dating scene is like crazy now i'm not really you know i've been in a relationship for like a long time but um from like people i know that are like you know trying to date and stuff like that like um no one does like in-person dates and no one really like goes out to dinner anymore or does that like what what you do is you meet on tinder you hang out and then maybe the next time you fuck and like that's it that's how the date goes uh, it's like like uh, you know i don't I, I i'm pretty young you know i'm 19 so this is like just my age group but yeah i definitely like like mm. the, the whole dating thing is kind of like going to like a bar and like meeting a girl there is not like a thing that i i hear about very much well what about, <laughs> so what about a restaurant different. not not a restaurant even i, I don't know no, that just sounds no. really uh, really strange nope so what oh, wait God. wait so we would just you would just meet Billy? up you would just meet oh. up see each other okay this is you this is me we're gonna go up and we're gonna have sex and that's it what about i, I mean know, pe people will like they're flirting people people will like uh will like watch netflix together that's like a thing i mean <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like that is that is millennial th this is the sex positive millennial culture we're talking about i mean that's that's hookup culture i mean you're saying that maybe they won't fuck on the first date, so there's like a small difference between Zoomers and Millennials, mm. but I no, think no, but he, but he said maybe they don't no, fuck at all. No, but some, he said that there's yeah. no first date. How could there be a first date if it's only online? So Turkey Tom, can you actually? Uh, I mean, I mean, okay. That? So for so for example, right? Um, I've never used Tinder or anything like that, but I got to college like a year ago, so I'm in my second year now. I'm a sophomore, but a year ago I started college, and I get to school, and you know. Um, I, everything's going well. And then my friend and I were invited to hang out with these three girls from the floor below us. So we go down there and we're hanging out with them. And, you know, there's this one girl, she's like kind of short. She has like dyed black hair. She's wearing a My Chemical Romance t-shirt. We talked about <laughs> it a little bit. That's it. 
but it was not it was not like an intense conversation like you know oh, i barely man. remembered her name after this conversation oh uh, she also she did the, there's like this tiktok thing where girls will like poke their fingers together as like a sign of nervousness that she was doing which i found kind of obnoxious but it was whatever, you know. like, like this they're styming. Yeah, like, like kind of like that. Shit. Yeah. Wow. But uh, but but anyway, it, it, it is by um, the way kind of like Chris Chan in a way where Chris Chan would regurgitate Family Guy references. It looks like they're regurgitating anime references because they don't have any other kind of like human references to sure. go on. But like, Wait. keep in mind, like I, I didn't know this girl at all. I barely know anything about her. I didn't know. I think she was Hispanic. I didn't know where her parents were from. I didn't know anything about her at all whatsoever. We probably talked for like twenty minutes. Okay. Um, and I was drunk during that time. So I was not in like a, a great <laughs> mental state to like have a conversation with anyone. The next day, uh, my friend and I are, are talking and this, her friend like comes up to us absent of the other girl. And she's like, yeah, that, that, the, uh, the, this girl, uh, is like down. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And she's like, well, she wants to fuck you. And I was like, well, I don't know her. Like we <laughs> haven't even had a conversation. I don't know her first name. Um, oh, and I, I and I don't think that's like a super common thing among like girls my age, but I will say that like the ones that are into that are unashamed about it now. There's like a whole there's a very big culture around like not you know no slut shaming or that kind of thing. Damn. So one thing I want to say I want to jump in and say is and so I, I did I did a stream last night with my podcast and someone articulated a point I've been trying to make much better than I've been able to, which is like you know when the late seventies roll rolls around. Uh, punks start emerging, but it's not like everybody's a punk, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still it's still considered a trend into into the eighties. And I and when I talk about like uh, you know sex positivity or sex negativity, that's kind of I'm kind of thinking in those terms. I'm also thinking largely about the media narrative, not necessarily people's like you know lived behaviors, right. uh, which can be like kind of confusing because like look, not every millennial woman uh, was you know, racking up as many bodies as she could uh, just to like be empowered. However, if you only read Jezebel, et cetera, yeah. or Vice, oh, you would right. believe, right? But, and that's what I'm talking about. Like there's a lot of people are normal, obviously, right? There but was this one story. Um, I feel almost dirty for hold. I feel like this book is not written for me as a man, but there is this one story in a uh, trick mirror by Gia Tolentino where she's like, describing in like meandering detail a date with some guy i think it was and it's like it, it really hit me that millennials and zoomers now don't know what the fuck we're doing anymore because we don't have that same um let's say narrativized pressure of like what domesticity looks like because the only people who are capable of larping domesticity are like weird fetish people now so it's it, you know what I mean? It's like, wait, the, what do you mean dom domesticity? Like the bourgeois middle class lifestyle, white picket fence. Like you meet someone, you date for a while, you get married, you have 1.5 kids. Hmm. And, no, but Gio, like, you've got your family, so you must have an, a secondhand understanding of how their experience was. So why not? Yeah, be able but to like, like, yeah, what I mean is like a, the culture as a whole. It, it seems like a lot of these like tropes have become like redditified specifically among like uh, certain demographics without naming them where well, they a lot sort of, of that is like take them, there's, a, there's this know. obsession with my generation with like categorizing and like like you know yeah. like, like branding everything and like you know yeah. putting it into a box where you can like hold it and you know that's that's mm. I think this is like a greater product of like you know there's this whole like no one has a personality anymore. And I'm guilty of this as well. Like no one has a personality. Your personality is based off of what brand you wear or what yeah. t-shirt you wear. You know what I mean? Like, well, like, you asked me Turkey Tom about the picture um, that someone did of like the average zoomer girls, like e girls room. The yeah. So I would say this is, this yeah. is not the average zoomer girl, but this is well, a common zoomer girl. You'll find a common, in a while, yeah. I would say uh, like this, this is just disgusting fucking bedroom is un yeah. an unreal phenomenon. I've seen like many that New times. Yorker, the New Yorker picture. It's <laughs> my friend, pill eater, shout out to pill eater, a X a Adam Lear is mm. living a X a Aryan Asian fusion. Um, he had this video on that, that artist, <laughs> that artist in that New Yorker cover of like the, the girl remote working and she's got her glass of wine and her cat is like litter boxes in the background. And there's junk in her room and there's like Amazon boxes. Like to me, that's a cultural statement that exposes, I think the, 
especially under the last two years for obvious reasons. It's an acceleration of the trends that were going on anyways. Now women are also experiencing this like weird, neatish, like quasi neatum lifestyle or I, you know, low living, I guess you could say. Yeah. And it's really fascinating to me because I remember like going like, you know, I had friends that were girls, right? And you know, when we were kids, surprising. Yeah, I know surprising, right? Um, and uh, <laughs> not girlfriends. I mean, like they were my friends, and we would hang out together. Gal pals, <laughs> gal pals, I had gal pals. Yeah. But, by the way, I, remember... I, I love how Billy Pratchett got fucking into Chris Chan. Like, yeah, never heard right. about yeah. it. it was just like, yeah, there you go, went gal full pals. Throttle. And amazing. um, you know, they're generally like, you know, more like cleanly and conscious of that. But then it's like. It used to be that it was more like guys would wear particular interests. They would cover their room with it. But now it's like, it seems that to be alternative, you have to like LARP that mm. aesthetic of decay of like the fucking anime, the, the Wojakina like anime posters yeah. and fucking your birth control tabs are on the fucking counter. And like, like, me and my buddy Matthew Visto, who recently came back to Twitter, he was on a internet break. We had that podcast on my YouTube channel. We do this um, called Style Talks, where we just talk about um, various works of art. We had this one where it was these still lifes that this woman, this like e girl, painted, and it was like it was like a copy of like Trick Mirror, and like it was this like fucking pink double header dildo on it with like her birth control <laughs> pills she painted this and it was like kitschy and pastelly and like insta instagram kitsch right like millennial pink pastel but i remember just like we ripped it apart and we were thinking like when you wear these consumer pr like the consumer products become part of the aesthetic they become part of they inform like not just in that sense a form of like sexual liberation but also the identity of mm. like the forlorn millennial zoomer girl that is like cocooned in this, like this, like uh, this, like Skinner box of mm. like various cultural trends that well, they wear as a skin. Well, you know? Geo, this is exactly, I think what Rudolf Steiner and the does this as well. I, th I think right this right. is exactly what Rudolf Steiner. And this is what Turing Tom also talked about what Rudolf Steiner prophesied in his book, The Incarnation of Aramon. So originally oh, I listened to that uh, lecture by Chad Haig. We had a wonderful episode with him. And oh, yeah. uh, in this book, Steiner talks about how there is this coming age of Aramon, which represents like this dullness, this uh, sense of full-on materialism. And uh, Aramon is the power that makes people dry, prosaic, philistine, that ossifies them and anchors them in the superstition of materialism. And there's this one part where he talks about jesse smollett which i'm linking uh, right over here mm. oh. in the uh, in the thumbnail for you guys to uh read and it says on a political level another method which Aramon uses to continue the decline of humans is to stir up primitive emotions and break people up into irrational and ever smaller groups ironically the sjw's of today who claim to be committed to erasing all archaic social fetishisms are the ones most obsessed with the aramaic project and this is just like you said turkey tom with this aramaic project of categorizing people into the ever smaller niches of intersectional identity such that it's no longer enough to be just one type but as many in combination as possible just consider jesse smollett's insistence. yeah well this is the whole like yeah this is the whole like like they say these days like there's a, a saying i have with my friends like you'll never meet uh, a straight white girl because somehow they all have to they all have to like you know they, they, they often communicate their like sexual you know like like difference they're like oh well i'm white but i'm also gay yeah but, I, but i've never done anything with with a girl but i'm i am gay in my head and that makes mm -hmm. me special one yeah. time i thought about my best friend and doing mm -hmm. something but we didn't and, and the final part here it says and i'm curious what you guys think of this this an manufactured animal yes this manufactured conflict is, however, something which had to have arisen from properly demonic forces because mm. it has no origin in human nature itself and actively contradicts it. Wow. It's true. We live in the Kali Yuga. But Adam, what were you going to say? Well, I just was saying that one thing that I always get a kick out of on Instagram and shit is you see... You know, you like thirst follow really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all do it. Yeah. Um, 
And the funniest thing ever is you see these girls, they're absolutely beautiful, like 10 out of 10. All their photos are like, look at my perfect pussy and like my <laughs> and, and all this shit. But then their pronouns are they slash them. And it's so obvious that this fucking girl has never in her life really questioned the fact that she's a woman <laughs> but it's yeah. just the way like you can't make it just as like a regular old mm. anything anymore hot girl yeah well, everyone needs like a struggle now you know everyone needs everyone needs that like piece of them where they can like you know be like oh you know i've had it hard because of this reason mm. um, well they need and a, also they like need no one can just deal with no struggle that's well, yeah, and, and no one can, no one, no one can deal with being like normal, you know, like, like people, yeah. like if you, if you, if you like are an unassuming person, people assume like that there's something wrong with you now. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Well, I guess that is why kind of back in the day, people took pride in certain group things. Like I was uh, reading that Napoleon book, a uh, great biography, Napoleon, where uh, one of the things that he loved oh, to I do. I here, love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sh show, show this book oh. off. Oh, look at this thing. Look at this gigantic motherfucker. I got look you. Look at that. You could, do your, yes. you could do your short cheek curls with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so in this Napoleon book, he was talking about how one of the things that his soldiers really liked was that, uh, well, number one, he would always like disrespect and just always like be rude to the officers and the doctors, but always be really nice to the soldiers, you know, except for the ones who didn't deserve it. He would always listen to any complaints that any of his soldiers had, like he was always receptive, but also he would make certain nicknames for the, uh, what do you call it? Like the battalions or the groups or whatever mm. that they were a part of at like, you know, like, uh, I, I remember the exact names, but it's just like something that created a sense of uh, purpose and the sense of history in the eyes of the people that were serving under him where what they were doing was going to be read about in the future and it does kind of remind me in a way of the Aristotelian idea of the good life which is not something that you even realize uh uh, when you're like in your 20s or 30s or whatever, or I guess in ancient Greece, it would kind of be like 30s or 40s, depending on how long people lived. But the idea is that the good life would be defined by the entire scope of how you went about your whole life. Not particularly, you know, like, I think this is why he said that teenagers or, you know, like young people, they can't really define like what exactly is the good life because they haven't really lived through the whole thing mm. yet so it's like the overall thing what did you do with the opportunity that you were given type of thing from now on your name is gomer pile <laughs> 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 but um that, that was like what me and billy were talking about about um why did the manosphere die i think that was the cliffhanger from last stream um i think like this is correlated to it like the fact that like during the Gamergate days, it's like, it seemed like for a moment, you know, Gamergate and Trump, but like when you really think about it, who really won in that exchange? The Manosphere was gone. The, the E-Grifters destroyed themselves or while well, in the process of, and Anita just had, she won. She just had to wait because now like literally there was that tweet this other, the week ago, I think it like blew up. Where it was like, damn, all this shit that we used to talk about in 4chan about Tumblr, that's now public policy. So, like, good job, guys. Like, you really won the culture war there. Mm. But, uh, but well, no, that's, I, my, that's my thesis, Gio. Like, yeah, this is what exactly. people are, like, railing yeah. on me all the time about this. And it's like, oh, my God, Two-Spirit, which was a term invented in the 90s, yes. popularized on Tumblr, is now being parroted by AOC. Yeah. And I'm the crazy one. It's it's government yeah. policy in Canada. Then. Well, you know, in a way, you, in, Indigenous people. in a way, you could say that Anita Sarkeesian is like the uh, Muhammad Omar of that sphere. For those who don't know Muhammad Omar, he was the uh, head of the Taliban. And one of, his, <laughs> and one of his famous one of his famous quotes was the Americans may have the clocks, but we have the time. Yeah, it's like oh. what uh, what um, what CRK said on Twi on on uh, the Fed post. Like, you know, we can stay retarded more than you can stay solvent. <laughs> that was the Wall Street bets people. But um, yeah, you go ahead. But who is who is next? Um, well, Bill Billy. Yeah, Billy Pratt. I mean, yes, yeah. go for it. Um, why did the manosphere die? Um, I think that the original first generation of Manosphere thinkers, if you want to call it that, um, 
I think there was more room for nuance. I think it was mm. something new and I think it was a discussion. I don't think it's a discussion anymore. I think it's um, talking points that if you deviate from, you are yeah. immediately shouted down in any, in any discussion, be it on Reddit or, or a message board. But I mean, I wonder this. Um, okay, so Two Spirit, um, you know, trans, whatever, all, all became part of the mainstream that was from Tumblr like 10 years ago. Uh, what Manosphere talking points have kind of um, become part of that mainstream discourse? I mean, not so mainstream like politics, you know, political, but as far as even just online culture, what, what aspects or talking points that were Manosphere talking points 10 years ago maybe um, are kind of like on more like mainstream Reddit, mainstream Twitter? Mm -hmm. Now, I think right. that- Billy, I'm going to blow your, I'm going to blow your mind. Please do. Manosphere talking points from 10 years ago are now mainstream, uh, again, like Jezebel tier feminist talking points. And that's what I mean about the coming wave of sex negativity. It's oh, it's shit. just, that's, I mean, that's what's happening. And it's an accusation that gets hurled at me. And like, fuck it. Yeah, I do repackage Manosphere points because sometimes they're right. And it's true. And now- Default, I'm, I'm what, of what Manosphere <laughs> points would you say became part of the mainstream discourse? Um, I think there's, I think as older millennial, or I guess not older millennial women, but like late millennials are like turning 30, for example, mm. um, the, you, again, it's like the, the body count question, um, what dating is like after 30, like when you're 23, you could see, you, you can pretty confidently say dating after, after 30 or at like, precisely at 30 or at 29, 28. Oh, that's, it's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. No one cares. But once you get to that age, you realize, oh, fuck, they care. And I mean, the 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 millennials who are rolling up on those ages are just readopting, you know, stuff that was on on blogs and on Reddit uh, in the 2010s. Oh man, I'm fucked then. I'm gonna be 29 <laughs> in December. Holy shit! No, no, Geo. I'm fucked. No, no, no. Yo, you're not a woman. You're, you're a dude. Woman. You're cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh come on. <laughs> you're fine. Ge no, Geo, I think we should. Let, Geo, the by only, the way, we the should get Matt Forney lab. We should yes. get Matt Forney to explain it. I was actually. Just, uh, when I was we were actually, gonna have a stream with Matt Forney. Okay, so oh, I would ahead. love to do a stream with Matt Forney, but also I would love. You know who I'm gonna bring on, right, Geo? I would love to who? bring on our good friend Nina Paley on the stream. I think. Oh, that would be interesting. That, that would be a very because Nina, she's <laughs> um, so default friend. Do you know who Nina Paley is? No. Okay, so Nina Paley. She, I would consider her to be like a kind of like a turf old feminist, school, yeah, like femme. an old school rat femme. She makes a lot of amazing animations. She made uh, Cedar sings the blues. She made um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, Seder masochism, and uh, I think she's a brilliant person. You know, a wonderful artist, and she was canceled within her own hometown for uh, going against uh, trans. You know, the, like the whole trans idea today so she is in an interesting spot now where she's not i wouldn't say she's siding but she's definitely open to people who she may not fully agree with but at the same time the fact that she's speaking with them the fact that she came on btr with uh how uh he described himself to be a uh, counter semite not an anti-semite oh, what what happened to to thad kaczynski i heard he's a counter semite <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an ancestor. I'm a counter <laughs> yeah. She so That's she's it. a secular <laughs> Jewish rad femme animator, and she was a dominatrix in the yeah. 80s. Yeah, yeah. He actually that part. went on Jerry Springer to talk about banging like rich or like not banging, but like um dominating like rich guys. I forget the exact she was in some kind of weird like poly thing. She was like one of the originators of that. So, if I recall, yeah, um, let me see if I can find a picture of her. Matt Forty and Nina Pale, holy crap, that would be like here. here here's the yeah. picture of her in the uh, in the dominatrix outfit. Here, here it is. There you go. Let me do the spotlight. Here, look at that. Nice. I like the fuck, like little cartoon. In the, it's like the weird, like the loser, like nerdy girl now transforms into this sex goddess dominatrix. Yeah. <laughs> But the other so thing, I have a question. Yeah. I think I she was interviewed for, by Jordan Pearson. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I have a question for default. Um, as a as a girl, I'm sure you've watched, you know, growing up girl girly TV shows. Um, <laughs> were you a fan of Gilmore Girls? Uh, it kind of like made me too sad, to be honest. So I like oh, couldn't man. bear to watch it. 
I was, I, I mean, I, I was dating someone a few years ago who's like super into it. So I saw, I saw a few episodes and it just struck me as like, these two women are the protagonists. They're the heroes of the show and they're just complete assholes. Like it plays like watching it now. It's shocking how these were like considered like, I guess the heroes. So I'm just wondering like if, if the manosphere changed the perception of women, because I feel that prior to 2010, let's say, the women are, women are wonderful meme, I think was kind of generally accepted more or less that women are very put upon and women are just somehow inherently morally good. And I think the manosphere did shatter that back to, I mean, maybe like overcorrected to be fair, but. Oh, way overcorrected, actually. Way overcorrected. Way overcorrected. But, but, but I mean, like it, it was already absurd to begin with that, you know, women were just granted this like kind of moral superiority. I, I think Mean Girls in the minds of millennials pretty much shattered that perception, in my opinion. Like Mean Girls was like to me the millennial film. It was like the eighties, like Heather's or something like that. It, it was like that. I, like I remember I hated it at the time because you know when you're like a boy and you're like a kid, it's like <laughs> yeah. this is stupid. This is a chick movie. But then a few. But then like last year, I rewatched it with my mother. And I turned to her and I'm like, this is the fucking millennial film right here. This is a piece of, this is like trans transcendent, you know, like that. But I I know it was trying to be like this empowerment, like Mm -hmm. Tina Fey feminist thing. But the reality of it was it exposed a different side to like intra-female competition that especially young men had like no idea about. You know what I mean? Like that's... Hmm. And were the Gilmore yeah. girls, were they supposed to be like really, really well off? Was that a part of the thing or am I... I think it was the trope of like, she has rich parents, but she hates the rich parents. So <laughs> she like is constantly yeah. shitting on the parents. And I think you're supposed to watch that as like, yeah, you go girl, like fuck your rich parents, hmm. you know? <laughs> but I mean, just, just in little like... The mom is just such an asshole. I wish I could remember specifics. I, I did not prep on Gilmore Girls. Wasn't there, but... wasn't there also a oh, grandmother, well, a Zoomer... or lo- lo- like who's supposed yeah. to be like the matriarch of the Gilmore fa- the Gilmore clan? <laughs> like, it's... I keep remembering this stuff now, man. Well, what do Zoomer girls watch nowadays? What, what's that one show with like Friends? <laughs> they they watch Friends. They do Jesus. watch a lot friends, of Friends. They, friends they watch a lot in the of office. Friends. The they boys. Are all... Yeah, the boys watch Friends. Okay, they they watch. No, boys don't watch Seinfeld. Girls watch Friends. They watch The Office, and they watch uh, like Disney movies made for babies. That's what they watch. (laughs) And that's actually it. Sopranos clips from Borco on YouTube. Um, No, I think like don't they watch like um, Netflix? Yes, I think one the really terrible like SJW one. um, Euphoria is that what it's called? I don't know. There's some movie. I always hear like these weird corny movies that come out on Netflix that chicks are watching. Um, yeah. 13 Reasons one... Why, that's another one. Yeah. yeah, that was one of them. Some movie just came out uh, that I remember people talking about. Some Dear Dear Evan Hansen, I think is yeah. the name of it. Some like musical movie. I don't know what Doesn't it's about. Movie that's come out theaters. like four times. Like what's going on? Does anyone know the answer to this? I feel like this movie keeps coming out and it's like kind of freaking me out. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> what is it about? Um, yeah. it's fucked it is so fucked up it's about this this kid whose therapist is like write yourself letters uh you know like write yourself like self-affirmation letters oh and god he, oh, wait fuck. there's more so he prints one out and then some kid steals it from the library but then that kid kills himself and his oh. parents find the letter and is like oh evan hansen like we need to talk to him he was our son's only friend oh. it's, wow it's like what? really dark <laughs> Oh man! Uh, that it was sounds like, like the, an interesting the premise, scene. actually. It was a <laughs> before it was a movie. That's why it seems like it keeps coming out. Yeah, that was like the Virgin Suicides back in the day. That was a premium. F- I love that was pure Kino. Mm. Oh, dude! Wait, what, they, she, they came my from- first like my first actress crush is in that movie. Fucking what's her name? Um, She's in Spider Man. Kristen Dunst. Kristen Dunst. Yes. I never oh liked her. God. I was what? always more. Dude, you're I, no, I never you're liked her. Oh, dude, she was no. such a hot man. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, Gio, you're you're a redhead. Don't you have don't you have things for redheads? No, I mean '90s Navi Campbell, '90s Goth Navi Campbell, and yeah. Navi Campbell in uh, Wild Things. I was. 
By the way, check this out. I, I had to do this. This is the Adam Lair coin that I just created right now. Oh, sick. Man. <laughs> nice. That's fucking beautiful. You were doing a profile of you, so I just couldn't resist. Um, but no, I mean, Kristen Dunn, she always seemed as like, I don't know. She had the weird, like, like smarmy rich girl, like, yeah, this thing going on. I, like I don't know. You don't like good. rich yeah, girls? You, you can marry into her family and uh, get the money. I guess. I always liked, um, I unironically, she could, like. She can be the breadwinner and you could sit at home and make the YouTube videos. I, I guess, like, well, I guess, like. I mean, not like white That's trash, but like, at least. I don't know. like, you know, like, like 90s Chloe 70 or like yeah. that type of, what the you know, that bunny film with the blowjob brown bunny. Yeah. yeah brown or bunny, like, yeah. um, or like, no, even like in some ways, even though like she's a total, like terrible fucking person, but like, um, like Sarah Pauly and like certain Adam ago and you definitely oh. be into uh who's that girl from Red Scare? You're definitely into her, dude. Dash, fucking... no. Yeah, no. Um, that's your time. Nineties, nineties. Um, what's her name? Mia Kirshner and Exotica. That's like my. Tyler looked amazing in the nineties. Yeah. yeah. All those yeah, like very good, mm. but that fucking Aerosmith video. Yeah. I used to love that shit as a horny little boy. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think like the um the depressed hot girl is a very interesting trope. Yeah. You know, like Kristen Dunst kind of has that though. I mean yeah. her have yeah. you seen Don Cheer's Melancholia? Oh yeah, you Melancholia, yeah. The Ophelia pose, like um, yeah. pawn. I, I even think like in terms of unconventional beauty, um, I'm trying to think uh, what would be like you would consider like an unconventional type of that same generation. I'm hey, guys. Really... Yes. Yeah, what, sorry who? to interrupt. Oh, no, no. I'm, I oh, just, um, I've been up since four in the morning. That's when I get up. So oh, shit. I, oh, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little beat and I got to go make dinner. So I, it, was, it was a real pleasure again to, to be on the show. Guys, please Thank follow. You, my friend. Please follow Billy Pratt on Twitter. Please get his amazing book. Welcome to Welcome hell. Welcome to hell. Here is the uh, here is the link. Kill the party. That is the Twitter account of Bad Billy Pratt. And here is the Amazon.com link to Welcome to Hell with our uh, what's her name? Uh, that uh, woman who did not uh, <laughs> Casey Anthony. Casey, Casey Anthony. Anthony. Um. But yeah, thank you. Please come again, my friend. That all right? Thank you. Even when we have Matt Forney on, mm -hmm. we'll yeah. oh, absolutely. But Let's I, do it. I have a question for you guys. So this is a YouTube video of uh, Yata. I don't know if you guys remember. I know Turkey Tom. If this is before your time or not? Yeah. Have you, have you heard of this? So this I don't one, know what that is. Okay, so this <laughs> was on uh, Albino Black Sheep back in the day. Oh shit! You remember the yeah, Yata music that's video? That's a blast from the past. Irrational exuberance. So there was one thing with uh, Liv Tyler in here. Which, please let me know what exactly is going on. So let me see if I can find it. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so hold on. I got to scroll this. While I'm scrolling this, patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. Uh, Richard Simmons is here. So $20 patrons are going to get a beautiful wooden magnet. And uh, $30 patrons are going to get a beautiful print from Geo. And $50 patrons are going to get all of that plus a custom uh magnet of whatever artwork you want me to uh, uh my dad to create and of course five dollar patrons are going to get uh, secret areas inside of our discord they're going to get exclusive and we are going to do a stream really soon we're going to do a bcr reunion stream getting the band back together it is happening it's just uh it just by takes the way time. yes speaking of women hot women and trends i fully i am pierce brosnan pilled um, I think what he's doing, he's doing God's work with his wife. We need, we need fluffy women, in my opinion. So uh, there you <laughs> okay. go. Yeah, here, here so. I, I found and, it. And uh, with that, I'm also going to pop up this <laughs> oh, default, default friend, default friend, before you go, I have a question for you. If you, if you know this, I don't know if you even know this. So this is from the uh, Yata music video with uh, Liv Tyler. And I guess that's Liv Tyler in that picture over here. And it says, we thought she could do only do crappy comedy. She, uh, I guess she could do crappy music too. Ironic, don't you think? So I, I don't know what exactly this is about. Can you? Can anybody here explain this? Uh, <laughs> I don't even like think it's really Liv Tyler. 
That's not Liv Tyler. That's not Liv that's Tyler. That's Morris, not... Bit, is it not? Yeah, oh. that's <laughs> okay. Shit. Oh, God. I thought this was Liv Tyler this whole time. Yeah, that's why I wrote, you know, <laughs> ironic. <laughs> like taking uh, number five and saying it's the number 10. When I was, speaking of women, when I was younger, I, I liked, uh, I liked Lita more than Trish Stratus. So that probably tells you my preference mm. i don't know well i like galadriel Probably. more than the Liv tyler elf yeah that one, fuck. yeah i like the early Levine. 2000s time capsule yeah all right guys um, i'm gonna pop off all right, thanks for having friend. me on thank you so much oh, okay. you have to come please, again please please follow after the orgy podcast i gotta plug a wonderful i podcast have to actually binge the newer do. episodes oh thank we should have you on do you oh my god i'd love to oh Interview with an incel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're gonna call your your episode now. You've yes. cursed yourself. Yes, right. please DM me. We gotta schedule this. This is gonna be right. amazing. We'll do. Oh bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye, my friend. And Adam, you have to go soon. Yeah. You got, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Your uh, your handler is here yeah, in the background. Yeah, Alex Beanstalk behind me. I, oh, nice. Nice. I rent out his living room as a workspace. This is a. This is a zone of genius up in this apartment. Oh yeah. Nice. Well, then with um, then with that, we are going to be ending the stream. I want to thank everybody for watching. Big thank you to Turkey oh. Tom. If you guys have not seen Turkey Tom's videos on YouTube, what are you doing with yourself? Turkey Tom is a And honestly, uh, you know, you should only check out mine and not their stuff, because I'm the only one who stuck around to the end of the stream, if you think about it that yeah. way. <laughs> here I am. That I've persevered brutal. for the entire thing. That is quite the I know, dedication. thank you, my friend. Always I have nothing else pleasure. to do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel like we don't plug his podcast that he does with... Uh, who? Who's your co-host, The Oreo Man? Um, oh, yeah, Nick, Nick, Nicholas Nick the, the Oreo, Oreo and, uh, yeah. and, and Vega, yeah. No, it's a, yeah. a good show. We haven't, we haven't put out an episode in a month, but our last one... The last episode well. was... A, yeah, the last episode, I think, was about... It had to have been about Keemstar or something like that. You've had yeah, Keemstar on the show. We always got to talk about that guy. Yeah, we did have him on the show. Um, Nick's actually wonder... like working for him now. Oh shit! I, <laughs> I wonder, a like, our producer. Oh man, I wonder if like BTR ever had Keemstar. What we would talk about? <laughs> I wonder. Like, it would just be the hate, like Ethan Klein for fucking two hours. Yeah, Keemstar would oh. not. I mean, he's not engaging in any like conversation about philosophy with you or anything. Like, you think my engagements with that are bad? Like, imagine. A guy who's like been like 12 years old since he was 12 <laughs> who, like, makes a living destroying people's like internet lives you know what i mean like oh, uh, fuck. the guy uh i mean it would be a good show actually it would, be it would be. oh and <laughs> we do have a uh, super chat by the way thank you so much adrian for reminding me i'm going to uh, say the uh, super chat as well but here is a link to the podcast half-baked podcast and i love the animations in there who does the animations Thank you. Yeah, we have a few um, different artists that we have, and then our our editor Vega, who's also on the podcast, he puts the actual like animations together. Um, nice. So basically, what we'll do is we'll have each artist do like a, a set of pictures, and we'll make sure they know that it's going to be animated, so they they create a few different assets for it. And uh, yeah, it's it's cool. Excellent. And um, well, let's see what else. What else can I say about this? I mean, it's a beautiful art style, and uh, I love this one over here. I see you're missing out if you haven't watched the latest half baked podcast episode. And you're just uh, sipping on your uh, Monster Energy drink over here. And let's see who exactly. else. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> there's this uh, girl in the background with the uh, colored hair and this other blonde girl. I mean, they, they both have a pretty uh, pretty big breasts over here. But the blonde girl yeah, yeah, seems yeah, to yeah, be yeah. really uh, sticking out there. <laughs> they got <there>. big bazooms. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of Italian slang, there is one last thing that I wanted to cover, which is the um, there was a New York Times article about the uh, Sopranos. Why do young people? Oh yeah. Why are young people watching The Sopranos? And there's it's because of Borco on YouTube. He's a made guy. That's there's the worst article on hyperallergic, where they attach all the typical hyperallergicisms to the. Sopranos. Oh man. When it's like well, The Sopranos was good because it was racist, <laughs> not because it was intersectional, you know. But this is because a... Tony was proven right about his racism every mm -hmm. single yeah. time. But that's article, like. You know, he's like he's like our well back. Tony Soprano was like our well back. Mm. Oh my god! <laughs> you know, that's but, how I. Feel. There's a strange, strange send part me, in this. Adam, uh, you gotta send me that article, bro. I have I to read this. It. So over here, hyper allergic is such a fucking rack. So, so over here in the New York Times article, it says uh, one oddity that can't be ignored in the Sopranos resurgence 
is that somewhat atypically for a TV fandom, there is an openly left-wing subcurrent within it. Less, no way. Yeah, less I feel so seen by this lefty than I don't even know what that means. I feel so seen by this. Turkey Tom? What, what I think there is some stuff in Sopranos about like, like what would lead to... Like there's talks about globalism. Yeah, like the whole season. But that's after- not. But that's not left. That's at least I always thought that globalism would be more right. At least today, that well, would be more of a. Like Wall Street was essentially like a, a left wing populist anti-globalization movement. So I, I mean, I suppose you got unlike labor issues, and then like the talks of um, like the whole fourth season. It opens with Tony having a meeting with his capos and being like, "Where's the fucking money?" The implication yeah. being that yeah. no privately owned small business to extort anymore mm. um, what happened to that guy it died on the vine it died yeah. on the vine on yeah the vine. yeah that's yeah. an amazing scene fucking gandolfini was so oh, man. good at certain points of that show like one of, one of the worst episodes for me was um not worst in terms of it was a bad episode it was a great episode but like in terms of just it made me uncomfortable was the ralph Cifaretto one where he like beat tracy to death and you like Oh God, it's horrible. Man. Yeah, that was like, like Ralph's entire function on the show. <clears throat> the third season was supposed to be about, <clears throat> excuse me, it was supposed to be about Livia turning witness against Tony. Yeah, but then but the Nancy yeah, Marchant away. Yeah, so, yeah. like Ralph Cifaretto was supposed to be brought in specifically as, um, like mobster is pure id. Like the guy yeah. who puts Tony's violence in his own face and feels no remorse about it coupled with the fact that his extreme cunning and ruthlessness makes him Tony's best earner. So he has this like entire dilemma between really wanting to kill this guy because he does the things that Tony does without remorse versus uh, the fact that if he killed his top earner, he'd lose the respect and trust of his subordinates. And then the end, it was because of Pio Mai. <laughs> so, um, right. Yeah. But Pio I, Mai was like, you know, remember in the last part of that episode after he kills Ralph, he sees the photo of Tracy. So, yeah. And, and when he when he's killing Ralph, he says she was a beautiful, innocent creature. What did she do to you? He's clearly doing a double entendre referring about Tracy, to Tracy yeah. as he beats this guy's head in. And and before that, there was that meeting between him and Ralph when. By the way, I fucking hated Jackie Jr., but, like, I hated him even more than AJ. Like, about, you did try to, like, where Tony was, like, doing the double innuendo of, like, you did try to school him as best you could, right? Meaning, like, you fucked this kid up. You were the one that told him about the card game. You fucked his life up. Jackie's senior's kid. My best friend's kid. And it's, like, that weird... Like, yeah, like he's, he's mm-hmm. uploading his own guilt onto Ralphie. Ralphie is yeah. like his convenient antagonist. Yeah, Ralphie was like like Tony's more like a more common sociopath. Ralphie's mm-hmm. a more like unhinged mm-hmm. libidinal. Psychopath. Yeah. There was also an interesting thing with Pio Mai. You remember when they were taking Pio Mai away in this very undignified way? They just uh, had Pio Mai attached to the yeah. Oh, yeah. And I- I also think we're missing one key thing from the Ralph, Mm. which is that the episode that Ralph gets killed is also the episode that Ralph's son is uh, grievously harmed by an arrow. Yeah. And we start to see for the first time a redemptive angle to Ralph, him Mm. coming to terms with his own brutality. And that is what I think in the end, it was Tony's worry that Ralph more than him was capable of finding peace and redemption. Shit. Yeah. You know, wow. that is like what Tony killed him for. And, well, even and it's also it's also an interesting combination where you have Lord of the Rings being parodied by uh, Ralph's son while Ralph was parodying the gladiator when yeah. he was hurling, you know, the uh, right. nunchucks or whatever at that poor that poor guy keeps getting abused throughout the entire Georgie. Sopranos. Yes. Georgie, yeah. But they didn't like, have flat tops in ancient Rome. <laughs> they didn't have flat tops in ancient Rome. But but even like the fact that Ralphie, like he he was on one end, he was a sub, but he was also a sexual sadist mm. because he was getting dommed by that Gloria chick and also okay, by Janice. ironically enough no, he Janice. Was talking, yeah, Janice. Yeah, he talked yeah. from the bottom. She said. Yeah, <laughs> and and so he was 
But when it came to Tracy, he was a total sexually depraved. Like he had like the fucking spit roast where he's like, I'll give you something to cry about. And then like when Silvio was like pimp slapping her, mm. it was like she he was like fucking laughing like a sociopath. Yeah. And, and so, poor Tracy wanted to give Tony, you know, just some like trying to reach out to him like some father. And then figure. Tony was like, just go get an abortion and fuck off. Like, yeah, that right, was right. Yeah. She wanted the same episode. And he didn't want the, the hassle. Yeah. And then and then like the fact that um Ralphie he always had this like craven desire to be like when Tony doesn't give me recognition, then I'll weasel to Johnny Sack and be like, we have to get rid of him. But at the same time, it was Carmine that wanted to get rid of Johnny Sack. And then when Tony asked Junior for advice, he's watching um he's watching uh how, what was that fucking game show? Um who do you want to be a millionaire? Was that what was it? No, no. Yeah. Really? Really? Was it? I don't. I don't remember now. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was. I think it was. You're right. Yeah. And and so he's like, look at this poor bastard. He's got his last yeah. life line. Lifeline. It was like that was, you know. Um, but but then in the end, like I I I personally at the time hated the sixth season. I thought it was needless. It, but then now I realize that really it was the decay of hmm. the Sopranos. Yeah, no, I mean it opens brilliantly with a montage sequence mm. with William S. Burroughs waxing lyrically on Control Society. Yeah. And ends with Carmela having a ghost dream about Adriana in the house that is on the property where Adriana was murdered. Like, yeah. that show was fucking, you know, it is one of those things. Well, no, Adriana was murdered in the woods. Yeah, but I thought it was the spec property that they had already purchased. It was near the spec property. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Sopranos is one of those things because it's like so cliche to talk about how good it was, but yeah. that show was fucking deep. And it was also a supernatural yeah. show in a way. Like it did not shy away from the supernatural in quite you know a literal way where there was that psychic. Yeah. You remember who oh, was able to accurately really know the names of the people that Polly whacked. You know where they got that from? They got that from Oz. Because um, not Bruce Mollis, the other old guy, uh, Rabido, he was like talking to God and he would like tell people when they're going to die. Yeah. And uh, mm. I think like Oz was pretty foundational in terms of what went into the Sopranos because you have this quest for like redemption and like at the end when they have monologues by characters that have died, they, they like post death, like in this afterlife, they have like a perfect clarity about their role as a criminal like when they brought back like they only had one episode but that's how iconic his character was they brought back dino ortolani to do this like monologue right you know I and mean, one, um well and what i love what i love about the part season six and two though is after the incredibly episode at the end of the incredible episode where he kills christopher mm, he yeah and yeah. he does mescaline with this beautiful girl He's like, and I made it in the, yeah, in the desert. And he yeah. craps and he starts winning after a brutal losing streak. Yeah. And it clicks for him in that moment that the life he has chosen, every fucking person is disposable. And that what was holding him back was not his violence and brutality, but his lingering sentimentality. And he became was, totally gone. Exactly. Like, yeah. So he's like, I have to protect me and my family. That's it. Because this yeah. is terrible. And that that even came, I think, I think even David Chase said that was inspired by that Twilight Zone episode. Oh, where, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like, because that was like the, like that one line in Lord of War was like the omnipotence of power, like, um, where like you can't die, you can't, it's almost like you're in this weird limbo, yeah. like, you know, like he was traveling through Africa and he like almost gets killed by these militia men, but then he doesn't, he almost gets killed by a coyote, then he doesn't, right. not coyote, a jackal. It's like that sort of weird, like you are omnipotent, you are untouchable, but that in itself is like a hell. Yeah. And like, yeah. Well, and Tony near the end, he was like, nobody was around him though. It was just yeah. like Pauly, Silvio, a few of the minor, like two bit guys, like Christopher was dead. Ralphie was mm. dead. Um, 
Richie Aprile. Bobby. Well, it was a furthering of Bobby. the decay. Bobby died, yeah. I mean, it was a furthering of the decay that uh, Tony talked about in the very first episode, where he mm. was comparing how the no uh, generation, yeah, the generation <laughs> yeah. before, you know, no more strong, silent type. Who was that actor that he was always referencing? Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper, <laughs> yes, exactly. And then he's like, used to be guys used to do their bit, no questions mm. asked. Now they got no room in their lives for the penal experience. And, and one of the most, and I think one of the most haunting episodes was the one where he was having that near death experience that dream in the hospital where yeah. people interpret that as him potentially going to hell or you know almost about to go to hell where he meets his mother and over here i was able to take a screenshot of the only time that we sort of see her face here this creepy looking That's demonic wow. silhouette and uh yeah that was a and it was creepy because it looked like all lit up and everything and everyone was having a fun time it by appears the way it was just like so like I imagine, like, if you were to go in there, then they would all just, like, start turning into demons, like, swallowing yeah. them up and shit. By the way, speaking of Livia, um, this new movie that came out today, apparently, yeah. um, I wonder if it's going to be on Amazon Prime. It's uh, on HBO Max. It's, oh, already, okay. it's already on? It's already there? Yeah, David Chase is fucking pissed because he said... <laughs> The only way this movie will work is if it's a movie in theaters, because I yeah. have to work with the show association. And then HBO Max was like, no, no, we're going to put it online. And he was fucking furious. He did an interview where he said he wouldn't have done it if that was the case. Damn. But you you had a great point when you were on the Fed Post um, with Egg God. And you had this great point about the, all these actors. They don't look like stuffy, like immigrant Italians. They look right. like just fucking hot out Hollywood. Like they had the Hollywood culture industry if I, yeah. the Sopranos. Mm. Well, I, 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 I would say Joey Diaz is in that movie. And uh, that's... Oh, like God. Fuck. Well, I just mean like, I mean, I think Vera Farmiga kind of works as Livia as sort of like a yeah. desexualized but statuesque woman. And mm. I think... I think the guy who plays Christopher's dad might work because Christopher himself, if not conventionally handsome, has a certain kind of style to him. Um, but like Corey Stoll, who used to work at this work out at the same gym as me in Park Slope and is literally like <laughs> six foot five and fucking built like a brick shit house, is not Uncle Junior. Like No, yeah. he was a skinny oh, dude. He was like yeah, yeah. a little um, squirmy. Rose, I gotta, I gotta duck out. Can I just plug some shit really Absolutely. quick? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So my book, Communions, is available for pre-order on hyperidinepress.com. It is also available at your typical uh, Amazon, Target, etc. Uh, for pre-order, books will ship October 8th, tomorrow night. I am doing a live reading and I will be taking questions from the readers along with my publisher. I will blast out a link on my Twitter and Instagram page sometime tomorrow. It's 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And finally, Safety Propaganda has evolved from a collaborative Substack project into a full-blown publishing company of its own. Our first release is by the, by the man to my left over here, Alex Beanstalk. Oh, God. Drawing and writing, and it's <laughs> fucking fantastic stuff. The book is called The Bitch Gave Me Jew Balls. <laughs> oh, fuck! At safetypropaganda.store. Get at me. Amazing. I have to actually write something for Safety Propaganda. I have oh. a thing about, uh, I, I just have to edit it more, but I'm work i'm slowly getting back into writing totally. but uh yeah this has been great bro i love go go to everyone that watches this show knows about the fed post go to that fed post episode they have yours with egg god they recently had uh annika chaya on maybe we can have annika chaya on lav who knows maybe that could be an idea <laughs> you smirk in art yeah um no, that would be great. Um, so we got great stuff coming. What is next week, love? Next I have week, to go eat. But um... all right, next week we are going to have Max Derrett and Paul Town. This has already been. Oh my god! This is, here is the link. I already have the link over here. It is upcoming 5 p.m. and it's going to be about autism and schizophrenia. So oh that's, fuck! It is. 
Oh. Here we go. It is happening. Here is the. Here's the like, <laughs> That's going to be a total disaster. No, it's not. Why do you think it's going to be a total disaster? G Geo, this is like that scene from The Godfather where, well, it happened two times in The Godfather Part One. Do you remember where uh, that guy uh, spoke, uh, you know, about like certain things within the family and then. Uh, oh, Fredo? No, no, well, Fredo too, but like before that, there was the other brother. You remember? And The Godfather had to. Uh, oh, come, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. I spoke. I spoil I spoil him very much. He, he, you know, you know what I mean. But anyway, anyway, uh, look forward to that stream. That is gonna be that is gonna be an amazing stream. It is not going to be what you said. It is gonna be Geo. It is gonna be an amazing stream. We're going to look. I through. feel like YouTube is going to put the like the mental health warning on the fucking stream. <laughs> This is a charity event. <laughs> like that's Yeah. I mean I mean for me personally I just I love looking at Max Derrett's avatar. Just like this happy looking Simpsons man. Oh. <laughs> They're just and, and by the way, speaking of speaking of Max Derrett, one one last time I wanna plug the uh Sonic the Hedgehog thing that I did. The uh how does it call the esoteric Sonic the Hedgehog's esoteric secrets revealed? So right now you can watch it. It's got currently how many views? It's got four thousand nine hundred and forty-four views. So Ooh. let's pump it up, people. I want to get a lot of people to watch this thing. I break down Sonic the Hedgehog, talk about a lot of the spiritual things that are going on within the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog universe. Oh, and the super chat. I completely forgot. Here we go. Uh, Massive McGee. Two dollars. So Turkey Tom, this is for you probably. Well, this is for everybody. But if you want to answer, it's Chris Chan Antichrist Saga issue zero zero one. So would Chris Chan possibly be wow. not Christ but the Antichrist? No. There you have. Oh, it. that would that would violate the kayfabe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next, uh, let's see. Okay, I did the Sonic thing. Uh, go to Adam Lear's Twitter. Go to Turkey Tom's Twitter at uh, Zapity. Zapti, sorry, Zapti. <laughs> go to youtube.com slash Turkey Tom. And yeah, go to that. Yes, go to that. <laughs> Shall I mention your other channel? Oh, it's not you. I'm sorry. That's No, that's not me. That's not me. Tom that's Dark. That's another guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, twitter.com slash Zapti E. Z A P T I E E for really cool, funny tweets that I make. Um, oh, yeah. Every day. There we go. And go to, go to my Twitter, Giant Geo. And, and go, go to YouTube, uh, giant my YouTube, Art, Giant Art Productions. I'm thinking of I'm, I might have to can the Chris Chan reading, so I'm gonna have to. I have this video where I'm talking about um, this one piece of art by uh, June um, June Nan Pike, uh, the the Buddha TV one. So I'm probably gonna do that. I so go in San Francisco. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, and two uh, two final things here. Number one, here's a picture of me with uh, Joey Coco Diaz. Uh, <laughs> this is back Shit. where I had uh, the uh, the long hair. And as a bonus treat, here is another picture of me with his co former co host, the Flying Jew, Lee Syatt. Oh wow! Here How do you have pictures with all these people? This is like, strange. <laughs> like this is a common occurrence. You'd be like, oh, I have a, I have a picture with this guy. <laughs> He knows people. He knows people. All right, guys. Apparently. Out. I will catch you all later. Thank you so much for having me on the thank show. Thank you, my good friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, amazing. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Adam. Ooh. And here is a picture, by the way, of me with a giant piece of pizza. See? That? <laughs> oh, you know him too. It's a New York thing. <laughs> all right. All right. So let's. That's well, the end of the stream. Wait, is it is is it the end of the stream? Is it really? Hold on. There's one more. Yeah, I'm hungry as shit, bro. On, I have to go. Hold on. There was one more picture Damn. I wanted to share. And, and oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hold on. Hold on. It's coming here. I just. Uh, this is a picture of me with this. Uh, with this guy who uh, is in the uh, marijuana industry over here. <laughs> I couldn't tell that he is the marijuana. Industry. I couldn't where, tell. Where was this? Where were these pictures this taken? Is, uh, well, this one was taken uh, in um, by Chinatown in Lower Manhattan as part of High and Y that I used to be a part of. I used to be a part oh. of this marijuana organization. Fuck. Oh my god! <laughs> so <good>. Wow, oh. <laughs> that's that's excellent. Oh man. Okay, this is the end of the stream. Thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe to everybody here. 
follow me on Twitter if you had not done so yet. My NFT, The NFTs are coming. Give me time. There's a lot of transitionary things going on right now that I have to take care of. But uh, the NFTs... <laughs> the NF Somebody wrote, JS wrote, what the fuck did I walk into right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, NFT, the NFTs are coming, guys. So, uh, yeah, Musk Calls is going to be finished really, really soon. I'm going to be uploading all of them. So, anyway, guys, take care. Bye-bye. Uh, God bless.